Yes, you, you know we're doing live. We are live. Okay, excellent. Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, October 27th, 2022 uh, regular meeting of the school committee as well as a uh, public forum at 7. At this time, I'd like if everyone could rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so we are going to start uh, out with our new business, um, and we can start, I'm sorry, I'm going to slide down with the s solar power purchase agreements and leases. Is that Mrs. Rothermick? Mrs. Rothermick. Okay. Yeah. I apologize, I thought there were a few things ahead of me. <laughs> 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 um, are we... Doing the hockey intent to travel? Oh, I thought we were doing that at 8.30. 8.30. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's why I knew there was Sorry, I apologize. I, we was we are, I was asked if we could take that out of order at 8.30. That's fine. Okay. Um, so as you know, we have been discussing with um, the installation for a solar um, installation on the roof and canopies for Hopkins uh, the middle school and high school and canopies for the middle school, high school, and marathon. What we are ready for at this time are just the roof installations, and that is for Hopkins, um, the high school, and middle school. What you have tonight is both the power purchase agreement and the leases for those um, to be executed uh, the select board did vote to accept these at their last meeting, and so this is a motion for the school committee to also accept and execute these agreements. Okay. So am I, am I correct in seeing about $100,000 in savings across all three together per year? Um, if I can jump on. For the Hopkins, um, what you are looking at year one would be approximately $33,000 savings. Is that big enough? Can everybody see that? How's that? That's yeah, better. That's yeah. better. So year one, approximately $33,000, and this again is for the Hopkins rooftop. Mm -hmm. For the middle school, Year one is 48, so that's 48,475. So that's already about 81,000. Yeah. And for the high school, there's another 21,000. Yeah, so it's about 100,000 a year. That's really nice. Can you explain, I just, I think if anyone looked at the packet, um, they might have questions like, just to explain this chart. Could you just sort of walk through the columns of the just what the, what's on this chart? Um, sure. Um, so we'll 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 do that for the high school. Yeah, just one of them. Yes. So as you see, what's over here is the um, size of the system. So um, two hundred one kilowatt. Um, the percentage of electricity that this solar on the roof will cover is 20% of the high school. Uh, what they're showing is the avoided electric cost of 17 cents per kilowatt. So when you get down, then you start <coughs> to get down into um, some of the other uh, savings. So year one, again, is the 21,000. Uh, the term uh, savings is 554,000 which is over 20 years, we will have saved 554000 And in terms of taking CO2 
reduction is 193,000 pounds and CO2 avoided is 1,800 tons. So each one of these columns basically represents um, what we're doing. So we're producing 200,000 kilowatts of solar. What we pay for solar to Eversource is 17 cents. So that's our gross savings. But then we will pay to the solar owner, because we will not own this, six cents um, for the solar that's produced. So we'll pay 13,000 to the 35,000. So our net savings is 21. Thank you. One question: The smart program is already like included in the in the savings, or is that going to be a separate? No, it, that's already part of it. Okay. Yeah. When you apply to do these projects, you get into a specific block, and that determines the the rate that you're that you're saving. So that's already built in. Yeah, I was just curious because with our solar, the smart money is a separate bucket that we get back so that's why i was trying to understand the because it's on your on your left hand side you do have smart pulled out right um which is the 13 cents so that's what i was trying to understand yeah this this does not come to us. Okay. So can I ask a question about, in, in terms of money coming, where does this money land? I mean, it, it, it's a savings, so we're still putting money out, but the savings is appreciated as part of the school budget? Yes. So what happens is, um, say we use, from Eversource standpoint, 100 kilowatts, but we generate 50. So Eversource is going to bill me for 50. Um, and the uh, solar owner is going to bill me for 50, but at six cents. Okay. So okay. I save yep. that differential of the 50 at the higher rate. Mm -hmm. That's great. Does that make sense? It does. Mm -hmm. It does. One of the things I really, if, if I read it, I tried to read all the documents, but it was just going in deep on the <laughs> solar. But one of the things I, I appreciated about the way the agreement was structured is that there are points in the duration of this program where there's a possibility to buy. Mm -hmm. So where today we don't feel with all of our capital that we're going to talk about, we don't feel that it, that was not the, play, the direction the town took on this. Um, down the line, we still have that option, right? And that's with so any year seven, solar installation. Yeah. Yes. So I, I was excited about that. Not that who knows where we'll be in seven years, but um, at least there is that option at um, certain intervals. So along those lines, I did email in a couple questions. Thank you for answering them. But just in case anyone was interested in, in the same questions I had, um, in that le similar near that language, I think was um, some information about how the, the the taxes might be divvied up between the folks who are leasing the or excuse me, we are leasing the solar panels, they own the solar panels. And so, um, you know, I had every confidence that it had been vetted by the lawyers, but just that sort of tax impact has already been taken care of. Um, but the other two questions I had were um, about potential construction on some of the buildings over the next couple of years and how that impacts, you know, if we have solar on the roof and we need to make additions or changes to the buildings. Um, so, I guess Susan, do you want to? I mean, I know you emailed me, but do you want to? Do you want to explain it? Was a better answer coming from you? Sure. Yeah, I've been asking about that too. Yeah. You disrupt the install. Right. What right. is the penalty to exactly. us? Yeah. All right. So the question was, how might the construction of the array on the middle school roof impact any potential grade configuration or need for upgrades and changes to the middle school building in the future? Um, so basically, any grade configuration to the building would be in addition to the side and not another story added on to the existing building. Uh, and that's similar to what we've done at the high school and at Marathon. They've been tagged onto the side and the modulars as well. Um, 
structural engineering, the buildings weren't built for another story, so you're not going up a story that would interfere with your uh, solar panels. Um, so again, the roof line would stay intact. And then for any HVAC replacements, you always have the option of a roof mount or a ground mount. So if when we are doing our studies and deciding what we're doing for HVAC replacements, we have that option of being able to put it on the roof or being able to have it uh, ground mounted. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and then I did also ask a question number two up there <laughs> about the warranties on the new roofs that have been installed over the last few years and or sections of roof, I guess. So. Yep, it yep. is it is called out in the contract that okay. any installation cannot um, ruin the warranties, if you will. Perfect. So that that's part of the contract. Okay. Thank thank you. And yes, all of this language has gone through the legal review of the town attorney because it really is a select board agreement mm -hmm. um, that the school committee then also executes. So this was vetted and written and reviewed by the town's attorney. All 200 pages of it. Yes. <laughs> so so like the, if the install is on like the middle school, it looks like it's 92% usage um, for the middle school for just this new install, I'm guessing. If because we already have solar on the middle school, right? So if in combined there is excess, does it, ha does it, can it be used by, say, Hopkins? Like, is yes. it just, it's for the district we share? We can, we can allocate it to any meter. Perfect. Okay. okay. That's good. I'm excited this is good, getting going. That's good. Thank you for all your work on that. On the, I mean, this is going to be great. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. It will be. Okay. It will be. Any other questions? Is there somebody who's inclined to make a motion? Do we have to do six motions, or how many how many motions do we have it, to do? It's one listed here. Like one for all of the it's, mm -hmm. it's in the packet. There's only one in it's the packet. Purchase right. agreements, plural, and leases, plural. Okay. Is that is that sufficient? Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so I move to approve the um, solar purchase, solar power purchase agreements and leases. So, second. Okay. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And that passes. And that is going to move us into school committee goals. I am having a little bit of trouble. They're on page 285 of the packet. Oh, they are? <laughs> <laughs> I did fine. Okay. Thank you. That helps. I'm just going to keep saying those big numbers. I, I do have that downloaded, <laughs> so that would, um, would you say 285? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did fine. Takes a while to flip through that many pages. So for people at home, we had met, um, a, now I can't remember the date, it was early. <laughs> month ago. October 1st. Uh, yeah, I was going to say early in the month, to do a little bit of a, um, a retreat and to come up with goals uh, for the school committee. And we, um, I, I thought, had a great session. And then we had, um, th this is sort of what came out of it. So I do, people I know have here have seen it. Do you want to... Um, Anybody have anything that jumps out that they feel like you want to jump into the meat of it and say this was wrong or this was kind of before we kind of go through the whole thing? I really like that they fit all in one page and they're succinct and they're straightforward. I feel like as written, I, I really don't have any edits because I, I think we did a good job of kind of getting to the point. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have just I, one edit. Go ahead. Um, on the stewardship of assets, the second category, the, um, the capital budget, I, I just wanted to put a little parenthetical or a little clause that says um, in support of the district um, curriculum. Like we, we sort of missed the part about supporting learning. Like, with the operational budget, we said pass an operational budget that reflects the district values, continues our innovative and excellent programming, and meets the fiscal needs of the community. In the capital budget, we focused on um, the stewardship of man-made and natural environment um, in support of academic or, or, or programming. Or something. Yep. We just missed the part about the student learning, which is obviously, as we're talking about Elmwood and yep. you know everything else with the capital yeah. plan that will come up tonight, it's student learning is implied but it would be nice to say it yeah all right so in support of student learning is that i think that's probably 
So I thought that what we had done with the with the goals was that we decided to pull that up to the top. We're reading through each project. We're thinking about resources, but we're also thinking about programming and learning and students. And they just didn't want to lose it. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Other edits that people felt. Just for the folks at home, um, it, it is on two page 285 of our packet, um, but we had three different topics. The first one was diversity, equity, and inclusion. The second one was responsible uh, stewardship of our assets. And then the third one is community connectedness. And then we established a number of goals. The first, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, we had two goals. We had three goals for responsible stewardship of assets. And then we had six under community connectedness. Um, is there anything we want to say about ESBC2 and the Elmwood School kind of separate from the high level general planning for the school district since that's very tangible and we're going to be working on it for the next year to vote to advance the yeah the school design right yeah I like that number four yeah so vote to advance the school design the Elmwood ESBC or Elmwood um, design what uh, not suggestions what's the word recommendations so, right yes but I want to know I'm thinking maybe we want to go a little more vague because okay. we don't know what the recommendations are going to be yet to so that it um, advance the Elmwood replacement a, plan. I would say vote to advance a plan rather than the plan. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, do yeah. we even want to say vote, right? Just be, you know, be aware of and involved in the, you know, the new Elmwood School. S uh, support the advancement yeah. of the Elmwood School project. Right. I think we actually do have to vote though, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, do, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. You vote certain elements. Yeah. So I was thinking support would encompass some of the making sure that we're present for, you know, um, visioning mentally present and uh, the visioning things at the, uh, to the extent that we're able to support their work. Yeah, that's good. Is that, and then also yeah. hopefully voting a solution. Yeah. Okay. okay. Technically the ESBC2 BC2 could be in all of them because we're also seeking community input so we're staying connected to the community about the planning and taking feedback and also making sure that whatever plan is put forth is inclusive and equitable for all of our students. I mean, I don't, I don't want to keep writing sentences <laughs> <laughs> if we don't need sentences and maybe I'm like thinking too much about it, but we're really doing all of these things in the work of think considering oh, like a new school plan right we're actively doing them um, so maybe we don't need to call it out because I just said it and it's in the universe <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know I just like I said I just feel like it's a very tangible thing when yeah no I totally agree so with you I don't know if I was overthinking like having to say oh so we're also seeking oh and I see what you're saying yeah like, and we're all also ensuring good. the designs are inclusive and equitable based I think on feedback and we could say some I think in supporting if we say supporting the efforts of ESBC2 and the contractors that they that they've brought in to do the work Okay. Maybe in the process of that, we cover all of those things. Yeah, that's fine. Like the designers, so. the, the PM. Yeah. So, the and the um, ESBC and contractors. Yeah, like the design yeah. firm and stuff like that. Do you want to actually put? Do, it feels like there are a lot of. Yeah, I don't think so we, we don't need to, to call put the yet. details. Yeah, no, I was just thinking out loud. What are the contractors? So put that instead of putting support the advancement of the Elmwood School project is that or in addition to in a different column well that's a good question do people want to say Elmwood School project or do you want to say the support the ESBC too yep. and their work like which one makes the most sense <coughs> I think I think I could be sold on either quite honestly 
then you can no it gets blurry anyway. between the two. Yeah. Well, that's what I feel. I think ESBC two is better okay. in a way yep. because once again, there's more tangible. This is the group that's doing the work, and we're supporting this group. Yep. Well, that's okay. the language you use with the community, right? So maybe it's just yep. for consistency. Okay. Could we loop it in with um, goal number three and say support high-level campus planning and the ESBC two um, in addressing enrollment and programming? I like that. Oh, that's I like that. nice. That's All right. It's beautiful. Perfect. You did it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you got to repeat that one more time. <laughs> support support high-level learning and campus, campus planning, planning um, and the ESBC two in addressing enrollment and programming. Okay. And that way, yes, puts it all together. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Beautiful. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to call that. Yeah. No, yeah. Get it in there. <laughs> Makes sense. I think that's good. Yep. Okay. That works. All right. And then the community connectedness. Um, I, I felt like we had some good concrete mm -hmm. goals. I do think we want to get moving on them. Getting some office hours and things set up. Mm -hmm. So we can do that offline though. We Not also had talked about putting the like on the other side or like a second page of this of the the buckets right right mm -hmm. um, just we did to, have to the sentence up top which is nice yes the Hopkins school committee has established goals in support of the vision mission and strategic plan of the school district yeah. Yeah. okay I like it yeah, yeah. I like, like it enough to, to make a motion I was gonna say is, if to everyone's okay in? with it I don't want to push this thing through but I'm happy to make a motion <laughs> no, if everybody's great. okay with it As I mean we put a yes. lot of work into it. we're not yeah it was many hours of work yeah, yeah. So. all right well then i move to approve the um hopkinton school committee goals as amended or edited i guess whatever the term is that's cool. appropriate yes okay a second so a motion by yeah. jen a second by amanda all those in favor yeah. yes. aye and it passes unanimously i am excited that we have goals and then we can come back and check in the, the mid-year point to see how we're doing with them Okay, so that brings us down to the Hopkinton Middle School stipend requests. Okay, there are four stipend requests coming out of the middle school, and these are all clubs that ran sort of tentatively last year, and then this would be the first year that they are sort of formalized with an advisor. And so we are looking for a $550 stipend for the HOSA club, and HOSA stands for Health Occupation Students of America. Um, they also have a, a counterpart club at the high school. I love that they're doing that at the middle school too. It's great. Yeah. yeah. So my only question, and maybe it's true for all of them, is it funded in the from the budget, or is it coming from someplace else? I mean, operational. Budget. Operational budget. Okay, it's already in there. We're good to go. So there are, you know, there are a number of, of clubs in there, and sometimes they run and sometimes they don't. Okay. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll say no fishing club. We'll take that and give it to the book club. Right. It's always Bummer student for the interest club, generated. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And these are in alignment, I assume, with how we do stipends, the, the, how we figure out the stipends in yes. the contract. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, so, move to approve the Hosa Club's stipend for 2022 to 2023 for $550. Motion by Leah. Second. Second by Holly. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the uh, Hosa Club is stipended. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next one is the tennis club. And for this coming year, there will be two advisors, but they're aware that there's only one stipend. And so what we would like to do is take that single $550 stipend and divide it two ways so each advisor will get $275. I'll motion to approve the tennis club budget stipend for $275 for co advisor for this 22 to 23 school year. Motion by Holly. Is there a second for that? Sure. Second. Second, second by Jen. All those in favor? Uh, yes. Aye. And that passes. Uh, we'll thank them for working hard for $275. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Sure will. Yeah. Tennis is not easy. Yep. All right. The third one is a book club, and that is also $550. Okay. Move to approve the book club for 2022 to 2023 with a stipend of $550. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion by Leah, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And so that passes. And there's one more? Yes, there is. The chess club at $550. Good. That's awesome. Go for it. Move to approve <laughs> the chess club for 2022 to 2023 with a stipend of $550. I'll second. OK. 
<laughs> motion by Leah, a second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, yes. and that also passes. And we have, I think, just enough time to go into the um, Hopkinton High School AHU uh, replacement. This is rather quick. Um, so the district used the engineering firm McRitchie uh, Engineering for the mechanical and related engineering for the air handling unit replacement at the high school. The construction documents and electronic bidding were also done through McRitchie. Um, in the end, we received three bids as outlined in the memo that you see. The original cost estimate for this unit was 125500 as you put the um, bid out, you tend to get uh, questions back for clarification. So there was additional scope added to the project for duct cleaning and additional insulation, which added 35200 to the base. The remaining additional cost of 62000 is attributed to the market increase of the units and costs associated with the required fire alarm controls work and rigging of the unit to the roof. Uh, reference checks were done for Enterprise Equipment Company, who was our low bid at 222826 And the engineering firm McRitchie is recommending the award to Enterprise. Any questions? Yes, my only question is, we're okay with covering that 63,000 roughly var variance. How's that? Yes, so yep. this is the warrant uh, that totaled 475,000, which was supposed to handle both the high school and the middle school. Okay. So what you see here is just the high school piece. Okay. Thank you. So what happens with the middle school that was planned? Is is that part of what you're going to be proposing tonight for next year? Or are so you, you will home? see that the additional cost request for capital for the middle school has dropped off. Um, what we have left in this Warren article, we're going to look to do another unit in the middle school. So what we had originally thought we would be able to do, the costs have proven um, prohibitive. So we're not moving forward with that. Okay. Any other again? Want to make a motion? Sure. I'll move. I'll move. Let me get back to the first page. Right? <laughs> Let me scroll for a minute. <laughs> Um, I will move to approve the um, HHS AHU replacement um, as printed in the packet. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Is second. There a second. So motion by Jen, a second by Leah. All those in favor? Yeah. yeah. Aye. Aye. Perfect. And we actually we are we get a about a minute and a half early. And I apologize, Robert. I did not tell you. Um, I had meant to reach out to tell you we started a little bit early because we had a longer packed agenda tonight so sounds good coming in we did not skip over your report that's for after the okay. um, awesome after we do our public forum so I think we can go ahead and sort of get started with the public forum and, and I don't know if there are any folks in the, the zoom is that opened up yet yeah so I think what we'll do is um, we had originally intended to do a little bit of a, a chat but I think due to te technical opportunities um, what we'll do instead is um, I'll turn, I'll unmute um, live here. I'll put my microphone on and I'll let the individuals ask their questions okay. directly if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. That's so let's great. let's see what magic do is about to happen. Do we have to do any kind of vote to open the public forum? So we don't because it's not a hearing. No. Okay. Um, but sure. so I think, that's a good question. Susan, were you going to do any... I'm, I'm waiting for the screen I, to respond. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I've been on twice now, oh, and gosh. the third time apparently is not the charm. <laughs> Technical opportunity. I, 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 like, I, like, I, that. I like that word. Opportunity. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. It was taking a moment. Um, so as you know, at the last uh, school committee meeting, we presented the first pass at the capital plan and as I started out, I told you there was a lot of information. So this is kind of the same amount of information, but it has been condensed since you heard a lot of different things at the last meeting. 
So as we put together the um, capital plan, we're always looking to still fall back on the district improvement plan and looking at those buckets to fill, plan for enrollment growth, meet every student needs, and build a community of respect and collaboration. The capital planning, uh, the mission statement of the maintenance, building, and custodial department is to promote the mission and vision of the district through comprehensive programs allowing maximum utilization of human and financial resources afforded in providing a safe, clean, and environmentally efficient and effective environment. The goals, ensure the facilities support high quality education, ensure equity and access to all students, project needs assessment based on facility condition index and repair history, project needs assessment based on enrollment projections, and create a clear and concise long-term plan that remains as a living document for end of life replacement cycle and energy use reduction strategies. So we have put together a 10-year plan, but what you see here in your packet is a snapshot of the next five years. What we're focusing on tonight really is just the FY24 column, and these are all items or projects that are over $25,000, and these will be requested at town meeting. In the years 25 on through the next 10 years, as I stated, those are numbers that will change as the district um, priorities and what is accomplished with the 24 plan, um, th those next columns could evolve. So energy use in terms of a long-term plan. Uh, the energy use intensity, EUI, is an indicator of the energy efficiency of a building's design and or operations. And this can be thought of as the miles per gallon rating of a building. The EUI combines all energy sources and divides them by the square footage of the building. This allows the building's energy to be compared to other buildings of the same type and set benchmarks. EUIs for new buildings are targeted to be below 30. And just as uh, an FYI, our both gas and electric contracts are up. So the new negotiated rates for gas and electric have increased 14% and 67% respectively. And those will impact our FY24 budget. So anything we can do to reduce um, our, our use will, will have that impact as well. So looking at two buildings that we're focusing on with these, with the asks in this year is Hopkins and the high school. So you can see that the EUI for Hopkins has ranged between 76 and 94. These were put together by the UMass Clean Energy Extension um, back this past January of 22 for us. And the high school you can see over the last three years has ranged in an EY of 64, roughly. So looking at that FY24 column, capital plan requests, uh, the end of life replacement cycle, there is a vehicle for 70,000, technology district wide for 75,000, uh, HVAC variable air volume replacements for 157,000, HVAC district wide for 1.2 million, and paving of the loop road and sidewalks for 1.5 million. And efficiency and deficiency testing, an uh, HVAC point to point testing for 98,000. And then moving into enrollment growth, the marathon playground, a new marathon playground for 1 million, the high school track and field three for 5.8 million. And both of those projects, there has been a CPC application submitted and the Hopkins School addition for 21 million. And just as a reminder, you spoke about the ESBC2 that is working on the Elmwood project. That scope will, won't be determined until late of 23. So the vehicle, um, this vehicle represents a replacement of one of four vehicles uh, for the eight maintenance staff. The vehicles are used for maintenance, towing, plowing, sanding throughout the district. 
Um, these vehicles are incurring costly repairs, and this is a replacement plan um, that will improve efficiency and effectiveness. We have been asked whether or not we can replace this with an electric vehicle, and the technology is not there for this type of truck to be able to do the, the plowing and towing that is needed. Electric trucks exist really more for the consumer, not at, a, at this level. System-wide technology upgrades. Uh, all the district wireless networks are designed to support high-density classroom environments and large venue events in all the school's common spaces. The wireless networks are composed of over 400 wireless access points district-wide. The school system is currently on a five-year replacement cycle and is looking to replace all of these access points over the next two years. After a number of years, these are not fully supported, and as new wireless protocols are developed, hardware has to be refreshed to keep up with security and more demanding environments. In addition, this cost is being offset by E-rate reimbursements for a percentage. Um, and one of the questions that we received also was, can this be spread out and do one school a year? Um, because we do this as a five-year replacement cycle, that would mean that it would be a recurring cost. So you would be doing a piece of this every year. The other piece is um, the E-rate funding. This is funded through Category 2, which only has two years left. Um, when that is done, they renegotiate or decide what fits into that category and is reimbursable. So there is always a risk that this would not continue to be reimbursed. So if it's spread out, it would be an annual cost and you do risk that E-rate reimbursement. The HVAC variable air volume replacement and controls. A point-to-point -point testing for the AHU 4 and 6 was completed at the high school using the Green Communities Grant. The result <coughs> excuse me, identified 12 units that are not functioning and the need for the controls. These are end-of-life replacements. HVAC district-wide, the replacement represents large air handling units and rooftop units, and this proposal is to replace three of nine units at the Hopkins School <coughs> and one of nine units at the high school. And again, these are end-of-life replacements. We're always asked what happens if you put off um, some of these end-of-life replacements. So you can see this is the plan um, for the next several years. So 24, as I said, we're looking at Hopkins 3 of 9, high school 1 of 9. In 25, another 3 of 9 at the high school, at Hopkins, at the high school 2 of 9. In 26, 3 of 9 at Hopkins, high school 3 of 9. 27, two of nine at the high school, then we move into the middle school, two of seven, on and on, <coughs> excuse me. So you can see each one of these years has a very large ask. So if you push it out, it just continues to pile on, so. And the loop road, um, there is approximately one and a half miles of road that needs to be repaved and the sidewalks along the road are also to be repaired. And I know there was a question about this being a road. It is actually not a road. It is actually the driveway to the schools, which is why the school department owns the repair of this. So to get a little bit more into point-to-point -point testing, um, these are excerpts from the Energy Star report on retro commissioning that was published in October 2007. Retro commissioning is a first stage in the building upgrade process. The staged approach accounts for the interactions among all energy flows in a building and produces a systematic method for planning upgrades that increase energy savings. When the stage approach is adopted and performed sequentially, each stage includes changes that will affect the upgrades performed in subsequent stages, thus setting up the overall process for the greatest possible energy and cost savings. 
In this staged approach, retro commissioning comes first because it provides an understanding of how closely the building come to operating as intended. It also helps identify improper equipment performance, what equipment or system needs to be replaced, opportunities for saving energy and money, and strategies for improving performance on various building systems. Retro commissioning is normally done every three to five years to maintain top levels of building performance and or after other stages of upgrades process to identify new opportunities for improvements. And researchers at three of the foremost building commissioning think tanks in the US, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Portland Energy Conservation, and the Energy Systems Laboratory at Texas A&M concluded in a study published in December 2004 that retro commissioning is one of the most cost-effective means of improving energy efficiency in commercial buildings. This next diagram is also from that same Energy Star report to give you an idea of what you get from a retro commissioning. So this was a study and it revealed a wide variety of problems. Those related to the overall HVAC system were most common. Retro commissioning provided both energy and non-energy benefit. So as you can see from these graphs, in terms of energy system deficiencies, air handling and distribution deficiencies were identified 37%, um, and then you have other 30%, your cooling plant at 11%, and some of the other pieces, the non-energy benefits, um, your equipment life, which is where you're looking at some of these end-of-life replacement, thermal comfort, which is what, obviously, and indoor air quality, which is um, the building that we, the students and the teachers, live in. So that is what we're looking to do with the high school, the point-to-point -point testing retro commissioning of all the high school <coughs> HVAC equipment connected to the building management system. The Marathon Playground. <coughs> the Marathon School was built with a planned enrollment of 395 students. The enrollment is currently over 592 students. Marathon holds 42 recess periods a day. The existing playground is not able to accommodate the increased enrollment. And again, a Community Preservation Act funding application has been submitted for this project. The athletic fields, long-term planning. <coughs> there are space constraints and condition issues on all the fields due to the volume of athletes. A feasibility study was conducted by Gale Associates to look at the condition and option for the athletic fields. The study was used to create a long-term vision to address the condition, equity, and access. During the school year of 2021, we had 1,681 athletes participate, and that comprised of 68 teams on our fields. The feasibility study indicated the following points. Field conditions were rated as fair to poor, most were poor. The number of athletes is not sustainable on grass fields due to the damage and lack of recovery time. Damaged grass fields can become unsafe as a playing surface due to uneven ground, transitions from dirt to grass, etc. Maximizing each field use is necessary for the number of athletes. The track is at end of life, useful life of 18 years. It has been resurfaced once. The underlayment is deteriorating, resulting in cave-in in areas. Field three dimensions are too small to use for other sports and lack safe run-out space. It's used for football only. And bleachers are too small, I apologize, I too was spelled wrong, for the student population and community members that attend events and lack of restroom facilities and potable water for the number of athletes and community members at events creates a safety, equity, and access issue. So we looked at all options for all the fields. 
looking at field three turf only for 1.7 million, field three and the track both a turf and expansion at 4.2 million, the amenities building at 1.5 million, field seven and eight making that additional parking, field seven and eight both tennis courts and additional parking, the lighting for there would be 580, Field 10, due to its dimensions and topography and wetlands, there are no options. Field 11, potential to be tennis courts at 692,000 with lighting an additional 380,000. And field 12 and 13, becoming turf at 4.1 million. And if we were to move the tennis courts um, back to field seven and eight, that would also allow for additional parking in front of the high school. After many discussions of all those different options, what keep, kept coming back was the fact that the track is at end of life and the, the limitations to field three. You can see what is currently available. The blue is the track, the, the number of the, that can access, and the yellow is what can access field three by addressing both the dimensions and redoing the track, it increases the number of uh, athletes that can access um, those fields. And you can see that by all the yellow. So again, coming back, the track in field three with an amenities building was identified as the priority. The track is at its end of useful life Resurfacing the track will not address the base layer deterioration. In terms of seating, the seating is limited. For events, seniors and juniors are the only ones allowed in the bleachers due to lack of seating. And expanding field three will increase its utilization. And again, the track and field three has been on the 10-year plan for a number of years. Um, so this is not a new discussion, if you will. And again, a Community Preservation Act funding application has been submitted for this project. Enrollment, planning for enrollment. Hopkinton Public Schools has experienced extraordinary growth over the last five years. This has resulted in all the buildings being below the Massachusetts School Building Authority standards for educational space for the current enrollment. If you look at the arrow on the right side, the actual enrollment in 2009-10 was 3,453, and it is projected to grow to 4,732. That's an additional 1,279 students, which is the equivalent of two additional schools for Hopkinton. As a reminder, the designer for the Elmwood project is conducting a district-wide campus study in an effort to capture the deficits in each school using the enrollment projections from Dr. Arthur Wagman. This study will outline the space deficits in each building and options to address the enrollment growth as a comprehensive plan. What we have done in the past uh, marathon for classroom addition is in progress. We have added four classroom portables to both Elmwood and Hopkins and six classrooms to the high school. What we do know and the priority that we have uh, chosen for 24 is the Hopkins school. We know that two grades cannot fit within the Hopkins school. You can see the building capacity according to the MSBA is 560 students. Our current enrollment is 640 students and the projected enrollment for 2930 is 730 students. That's an increase of 170 students for that building. This is a diagram that we have been showing for several years. This was completed by uh, Drummy Rosane Anderson back in 2019 that indicated the spaces at the Hopkins School. The classrooms are all considered slightly undersized, um, but in addition, looking at those number of students, there just simply are not enough classroom spaces. And again, 
from uh, DRA in 2019, they had uh, put out what the facility needs would be at the maximum enrollment, and that's what you see over here on the right. But again, what we do know is that the Hopkins School is unable to fit two grades. The estimate to come up to the 21 million is roughly an additional 30,000 square feet at $700 a square foot. This is a very soft number. The district-wide campus study that is being done for by Perkins Eastman will further refine what that space is in terms of square footage and what that cost impact will be. So again, as a recap, the end of life replacement cycle of vehicle at 70,000, technology district wide at 75,000, the VAV replacements at 157,000, HVAC district wide at 1.2 million, the loop road paving and sidewalks at 1.5 million, HVAC point to point testing at 98,000, marathon playground at 1 million, the high school track and field three at 5.8 million, and the Hopkins School addition at 21 million. Now I did receive um, questions. I can go through some of those answers. Um, so in terms of the HVAC replacements, I'll go back to that. All right, so in terms of the HVAC replacements, um, will we switch to all electric heat pumps and use no natural gas? Um, I defer to our engineer because I will not pretend that <laughs> I'm an expert in this. Um, so we are working with an engineer with an eye toward energy efficiency and according to the engineer, these are the issues. Um, first of all, heat pumps are going to be far more expensive to operate than gas. We have a very few large units on the roof that handle large quantities of outside air. By going with a heat pump, we would need even larger units in order to get the same capacity out of the heat pump. Um, for large applications, the heat pump technology is not there yet. By going all electric, you would likely need to upgrade your electrical service to the building that would, in, that would um, be able to carry the increased load. This would mean new service gear, switch gear feeds, and the heat pumps would need new conduits, panels, feeders, etc. cetera. Uh, heat pumps need to operate their compressors at high speeds for the whole year, as opposed to an AC unit that is used only in the summer. And you would have to replace a compressor every seven years or so due to those higher speeds. And lastly, uh, school buildings are typical block wall construction with little to no insulation. You really need an air seal and heavily insulated building in order for a heat pump to make sense in a commercial space. So that was one of the questions on the HVAC. Um, see else? In terms of the Hopkins addition, would this aim for net zero construction? And again, um, when we put this out to bid, we could in the contract indicate that we are looking for um, this to be built as net zero as well. I covered the vehicle. Um, the vehicle is not able to be electric due to what we're using it for. Uh, let's see if there was anything else I did not cover. Some of the questions on the Hopkins edition as well. Um, again, this is a soft number. Um, this is something that will be further refined by Perkins Eastman. Um, <coughs> they will get a better handle on what that square footage is and what the estimated cost would be. 
So this number could change, and as we have done in the past, then the school committee would revote that item to the adjusted cost. Um, marathon playground, in terms of the estimate for that number, that is also a soft number. Again, this has not been designed. I'll just go back to the. Um, the playground has not been designed, and we do not have estimates at this time. In doing a conversation with an engineer, the $1 million um, they did feel was definitely a sufficient number, so it would not go up. Um, we're looking to try not to go back to town meeting for additional costs, as we have done in, in the last couple of years. Um, we also have assumed a high contingency due to what has been seen with these unknown costs. Uh, and again, the number can be further refined as we approach. Uh, but to give you an idea in terms of the operations of Marathon, there are five to eight classes out for recess at any one time. So that's a minimum of 110 <coughs> to 160 students at any one time out at that location. The um, Preschool playground is already also currently used by OTPT, so the preschool also does not have full access to that playground, so that is also already being utilized by our existing um, students. I'm going to add one thing with the preschool playground as well. Um, in talking with um, Mrs. DeBow, one of the things that I've learned about the, the two different playgrounds, preschool is a playground, and when they, when they build preschool um, playgrounds, they, they do it with a particular delineation. So you can have a two-year-old to five-year-old playground, you can have a five-year-old to 12-year-old playground. So the preschool playground is a two to five. Okay. And the other playground is a five to 12. Another question uh, was around the amenities building for the high school track and field three. And by increasing the number of seats, there is a plumbing code that we would have to abide by. So we would have to put in um, restroom facilities. So I think I covered some of the easier ones, but fire away. <laughs> so, so Actually, I was going to see if we wanted to go to the public questions first. Sure. Um, so if anyone here wants to come up and ask a question. The other thing for people at home, I have heard that there was some confusion over the Zoom link because it's, it's dark. Um, but people that want to be able to ask questions, if you log in to the Zoom link that was on our agenda, mm -hmm. and you can get that at the hopkintonma.gov um, on the calendar, you can pull up our agenda. Um, and then that gives the link to get into the Zoom, and Jeff will make the mics live um, if you have questions you want to ask. Um, the other thing is we are not voting this um, budget tonight. So if you are not able to get into the Zoom for one reason or another, you can send us questions that we can bring back at our next meeting. So um, I don't know if you have any sure. people that are live there that would like to. Yeah, so let's. Come on up if you want to come yeah, up. Yeah, let's do it in person. Oh, sure. Have a seat, I seat right up here by right the, the microphone. Oh, okay. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> You're just. Share your, your name with us, just for the record. Sure, I'm Nicole Simpson. I'm at 16 Ledgestone Drive. Um, and I'm on the Sustainable Green Committee. Oh, great. Um, and so I think some of these have been addressed, but um, because I came to talk about that, I'll, I'll just reiterate, um, we are working towards a net zero plan for, for the town, and that includes you know residents, businesses, and municipal. And so we're looking at transportation and buildings and all these different areas that we um, will need to decarbonize to get to a net zero, which of course is crucial for addressing climate change. And, um, and we've stated as a town that that's an important um, objective for us. So um, as far as the car, I understand that um, it's not currently meeting the needs. I did a little bit of research trying to look into the new Ford F-150. Um, it looks like the base price is $52,000 and um, there are um, from the state uh, for electric vehicles grants for $7,500. I know EVs are lower cost to operate, especially when you combine it with the solar access. There's already ch charging capability at Marathon School, I'm sure, and a new Elmwood School would also have charging capability. So it seems like there's a lot 
there to support it. Um, and um, so I, I guess I, I'd be curious if you could expand on why something like that um, isn't yet meeting the need of what the vehicle, like, because uh, I know it has towing capability. I'm not an expert on pickup trucks, but um, where is the deficiency there um, that, that that can't be considered at this time? So in our conversations um, with the manufacturer, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, so when you use uh, an EV truck, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, to plow, mm -hmm. your battery capacity drops in half. So mm -hmm. at most you would be able to plow is for one hour. So okay. Okay. it just simply would not meet the needs. Mm -hmm. um, the technology is growing, but it's not there for a commercial use truck. It is definitely there for a residential mm -hmm. truck, but not for, it's not strong enough and the battery capacity would not hold for the amount of weight that you're either pushing or pulling. Okay. It's too bad. I hope as it those next replacements come along that we uh, continue to consider that every time um, the opportunity comes up. Agreed. And same with the HVAC system. Um, what I worry about is we make this decision now, but we're doing this replacement every year for the next several years. And does that lock us into that same decision? Because those last for a long time and it basically is locking you into fossil fuels um, usage for that extended period. And of course, key to getting to net zero is transitioning off of fossil fuels. And I know you are planning for great solar installations all over the schools, which is fantastic, um, and hopefully would rec um, reduce that high electric cost. Um, so if it's not feasible right now, I understand, but I hope that that doesn't mean that it's not gonna be feasible in the next couple of years and we look at it every single time we're making this decision because we need to start making these changes in order to have a chance of getting to a net zero as a town. Right. Each time we replace any unit, we send that out for design and engineering with those goals in mind. Um, so every year, as technology continues to improve, every year when we're replacing something, we're replacing it with potentially better technology. So what we, de <clears throat> what we decide for next year may not be the technology we decide for 25, may not be the technology we decide for 26. So it is done annually each time we look at the next unit that needs to be replaced. Okay. I think that's all I have for now, but thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah. Yes. Do we have any? We do. We do. So <laughs> I believe we have uh, Mike joining us um, remotely. So Mike, if you are there, uh, I'd invite you to um, unmute yourself and um, if you could introduce yourself with your uh, name and address. Mike has been with us for a while, so I... I Mike, it may be Mike Manning from Appropriations. Oh, okay. There's Mike. Yeah. Hi there, Mike. All right, Mike. Mike, so I can hear you. Oh, okay, great. I can ask Jeff to unmute when you're ready. Raise your hand and he can no, hear from the Georgia. Yeah, you're you're good, Mike. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Mike, go can ahead. Hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. So I'm Mike Manning. I'm on uh, 32 Briarcliff Drive. I'm uh, chair of the uh, Appropriation Committee. So I was just uh, watching uh, the the plan, see what you uh, was going to be proposed for this year. And I have to say, I it is certainly a lengthy list, uh, but I do appreciate that you have the long-term plans for everything. And um, I, so what you have so far, but uh, I look forward to uh, talking about the uh, uh, long-term capital plan uh, down the road, as you always do with the uh, appropriation committee. So I don't really have any questions, but uh, um, you got me thinking about it and I will be asking questions over the next couple of months. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks Thank for you. Thanks for in there for so long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it looks as though we do not have anybody else joining us uh, virtually tonight. I did receive um, a question about the um, CPC funding with regard to the um, potential turf field. It, 
um, back when we did the turf field before, there was something about the CPC not being able to fund a stadium. Is that different? Have the rules changed, or is that accurate? Because I know you were. That is yeah. accurate, but what is tricky, and this is where um, I believe both the CPC and, and us will have to rely on legal review because there is not a hard and fast definition of a stadium. Okay. So it, it is tricky. Okay. That's great. If there are not other questions on there, I would turn to see if people here we had, had a lot of this last week or two weeks ago, but I think the more you think about it, the more questions come. I, I actually um, have two. So the first one is with the Hopkins School Edition, the 21 million was what was estimated in 2019. Is that no? It's estimated now. Okay, that's what I wanted to know because I was like, wow, it's a big change. And then secondly, we, we got that email about PE that we hadn't mentioned PE and, and usage of the fields and such for PE, and I was wondering if we could work that into the plans. Like, I don't know if Susan's seen that because it oh. went to the school committee oh, and, and Dr. Okay. Kavanaugh, I believe. As I well. apologize. I thought it went to everybody. So there was, there was a question from a teacher who does PE, and she was saying that the the thing that she hasn't seen in the field usage discussion is the number of students that actually use you know the fields the tennis courts etc during the day right and how how that would be affected by all of this work and and whether it might actually even change some of the the work itself so anything that is used for pe during the day um would still be used for pe yeah. obviously during construction no one is using that so you know during construction we would have to find a safe place for all students to be um, but once it is constructed it certainly would be open for PE I know that they use the current turf field now um, during the day and they use the tennis courts as well yeah. and yeah. It, it's rare now for us to ever find someone on the tennis courts during the day but if we do the schools certainly take precedence because they are our tennis courts and periodically I'll send something out to the community saying please remember between the hours of 8 a.m. and you know 3 p.m. those tennis courts are off limits to community members and I think part of the concern I heard was the movement of the tennis courts to to the the, the other location uh, just a much longer heard to monitor I think was yeah. the concern yeah. if people from the community were on there it it would be further away for the mm -hmm. teacher and the students to. Mm -hmm. But again, if the yep. if the tennis courts and this is not for no, next this year, year, right? Right. Yeah. No. Exactly. If the tennis courts were to be moved to field seven and eight, that is adjacent to the turf field where students go now for um, okay. PE. So, in terms of a distance change, there really wouldn't be. There, there also was a question about storage of of equipment. Um, if there could. It would be a consideration for some storage for the PE classes out there, and that just is. It, you don't have to answer that now, but just it didn't. Yeah, just to just to let to you know, keep we didn't realize you hadn't got the email. email so. yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't post what I just pulled up the email, so you got it. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had a question. While you were speaking about the, oh man, I really didn't write this. Luckily, but it, about the field three and the track, um, so we're going from eight teams being able to use it to about 30. So, how does that factor into wear and longevity? And do we have an idea of if we replace it? We spend this big amount of money, 5.8 million, to replace it. Do we have an idea of how that will impact having to replace it or having to do maintenance when we are like utilizing it at a pretty significant increase? So the, the track, a typical track has an 18 year life cycle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, again, the track is at end of life. We've had this track since yeah. the school opened. Mm -hmm. um, so you would potentially get another 18 years yeah. out of the track. Um, turf, the carpet, I, I'll let maybe Tim can speak to that. Yeah, typically so a carpet replacement is 10 years. 10 to 12? 10 to 15 years, I think, uh, depending on how it's cared for. The shock pad, which will be used in the current turf fields, has a 25-year lifetime on it. Okay, and that, uh, regardless of 
the number of students, the number yeah. of feet, and cleats, and all that stuff. Yes, I think um, I think it's they give a, a service warranty of um, I want to say it's five years, and then um, but we've had it at Fruit Street for I think they just replaced theirs after. 12 to 15 years, okay. I know we get a lot of use out That's there. good to know that yeah. we can have more students there and it doesn't really impact the longevity of it. And, and the cost really changes after it's already been installed mm -hmm. and then you're just really replacing what we call the carpet, not yeah. so much the infrastructure underneath, which is a bulk of the money. Right, okay, that that's great to know, thank you. Yeah. And I do have a question about, the, once I, when we receive that email from our PE teacher, when we do these replacements on fields that our PE classes use, do we ever include them in the conversations about how we're making decisions, like these decisions? I know there's like a feasibility, sustainability, there's a budget consideration, but do we talk to the people that utilize these during well, we, the school day? We rely, we rely on Mr. Bishop. If these conversations okay. that we have, we rely on him to okay. be having those conversations so you with have his like staff. A middleman that kind of has to give you <laughs> what you need. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Bishop, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I have a turf field related question. So, is, in terms of visioning forward, if this project goes um, through town meeting, would this become part of the turf field oversight group that is working with parks and rec so that it would be have any okay no the the turf field oversight committee uh, their only charge is the existing okay. turf field and and management of rentals I, I, so i guess I, I i don't mean specifically that group but something like that group where it would be um used for town rentals as well is that or is the school use such that it really wouldn't have that kind of practical? I would have to rely on our athletic director. To oh, I'd love to have her come up because yeah. <laughs> we haven't gotten to have you um, we haven't here really, since you've been here. Yeah, and I will say we have not broached the subject okay. of trying to premature. rent out the, those fields. Okay, premature. Yeah. Welcome, Kyle. Yeah, welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone. He jumped right up to get up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Secretly, I've been yeah. excited to see you here and yeah. roll that yeah. So, um, Kylie, I did yeah. just mention, I know you were in transition, that we have not had any discussion about the potential for renting of these fields. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure, so what question am I answering? If, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess if I can rephrase it in a word that sure. way that makes it easier to understand, is the use so great that the school has for the, if field three became turf, that there would not be a lot of opportunity for community rental um, for like like we do with the current turf fields mm -hmm. or is there an opportunity there to get some rental income to sure help i offset? mean i suppose there's a possibility i think what i think of with the expansion of another turf field mm -hmm. is i'm thinking of our sub varsity teams our jv ones and twos and freshmen yeah. and middle school they're always playing down on field 10 field 11 field 13 field 12 and this would allow them to not get canceled every time it rains and yeah. to allow them maybe to go after school and have it's really the lights as well that are helpful yeah. um, to have later practices so during the week I think it would be challenging but we don't have rentals during the week now on the okay. existing turf yeah. um, the weekends it might open up typically for example right now um, mostly just varsity sports uh, have practice on the weekend and our field hockey and soccer teams typically practice on Sundays to allow for availability on Saturdays um, our football can't use the turf really, um, so they're up on field one. So I suppose there exists the potential for weekend rentals, but um, from what I'm learning, our biggest revenue comes from the baseball field down on the existing turf, and that's not a part of the plan for our field three in the track. So uh, I'm not sure. Um, <coughs> I know as far as town use, that's a that kind of different story when it comes to soccer. I, I can't really speak too much to it, but we do have a tremendous need um, that field will be yeah. packed. Um, I have a dream schedule in my mind, <laughs> and it's pretty much booked if I can have it. <laughs> yeah, I just I'm I feel it's it's disappointing to have to so often cancel yeah. our sub varsity in you know, our developmental levels. It really is disappointing. Um, so I'm excited that that if this could happen, that would change that. So that was actually going to be one of my questions. Was currently how much do they get to practice? You know, like. Are we are we 
Uh, do they go somewhere else to practice, or do we just cancel? That was part of my question. Like, sure. it just uh, just for an understanding of you know, the the teams exist right now, mm -hmm. right? So we're doing something with them, yeah. and just um, how much inconvenience do they have? Yeah, I mean, I think if you were to ask some parents in town, it's, it can be quite a bit. Um, so if we have a half day, our middle school teams don't practice because we want people to get home and get rides and all that. So typically they're already short a few days, that's why their fees are a little lower. Um, if we have bad rain and we're trying to get gym time, for example, or turf time, the first thing to get canceled is our middle school followed by our, our JV2 and kind of on the way up. Um, so, you know, we try to make that call during the day so parents can arrange rides, but we don't necessarily have control over away contests. So uh, Lou Sanborn, um, our assistant AD and I do our best to get word out to families, but sometimes parents are having kids home on the bus that they thought were gonna be after school for two or three more hours. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, weather in the fall is, has made it difficult. Um, but I will say, you know, there was a day a couple weeks ago, it had been raining night before, whole day, they're one of the only contests that happened in the TVL was our boys soccer games because they were on the turf. And the only thing that keeps you off the turf is lightning. And as we learned this week, fog. Um, <laughs> but really, it's just lightning. So, um, but we, you know, I was lucky we got in some games today because it's been raining. Even though today's a beautiful day, fields 12 and 13 and 10, they were really mm -hmm. soft. I was worried about middle school running and the, the trails. So, um, yeah, it's just... So it's kind of hard environmental conditions in mm -hmm. those fields. Mm -hmm. And so bringing them up to three would allow them to be safer. Oh, for, for sure, sure safer. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of unbelievable how quickly the turf, and Tim can speak to this better than I can, um, can deal with water. Um, and it's, we keep hearing about technology improvements every year. If we were to do this, the new turf would be even different, I imagine. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can, while you're speaking about that piece mm -hmm. of land, can you just speak a little bit about the track? Mm -hmm. um, because I think we, our track team is you know, hugely competitive. It's you know it's one, it's great, um, a banner sport for our district. But I, I know the track is old. I am mm -hmm. not a runner, so I can't appreciate the condition. But could you talk mm -hmm. to the condition a little bit? Um, I could do my best. I'm learning a lot right now. Uh, one thing is that we don't have um, enough lanes necessarily to. Okay. You know that's part of the expansion. I saw that, yeah. Yeah. So the biggest part of getting wider is because uh, football is the narrowest field of play. I think you've learned this recently, um, or knew that already. And so we have to bump out the field, which bumps out the lanes, and we need to add an eighth on the straightaways. Okay. So imagine four lanes wider. So that's a big part of it, um, and it op opens up a few different opportunities, um, as well as our field events. Um, we could, in theory, there's some designs that might allow us to get the field events onto that area down there, you, if you ever come to a track meet, we have field events behind the middle school. Um, so that could help as well. The technology and the track 18 years ago, things have changed a lot as far as uh, shocks and absorbing and all that stuff. So I have to imagine that would improve. I'm looking over at Tim for the, the, the go ahead. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question a little bit. We can also be a little more thoughtful about um, like safety as far as uh, shot put and javelin and the high jump pits and all those things um, so but yeah no, you, you said it it's hugely uh, competitive it's huge in numbers it we is. have a tremendous amount of students um, that use that track cross country uses it middle and high school in the fall um, and in the spring it's 200 athletes at the high school level um, we have another hundred or a couple hundred at the middle school level so um, I'm glad you brought track up because percentage wise they will benefit more than anyone I think from this just a, one last follow-up on this this whole package here um the amenities building so from what you just said tonight I is it not possible to stagger like do we, we do we have to do them all at once or could we not use the field with the seating capacity without an amenities building and what would the amenities building have in it what would it be so the amenities building would basically give you your restrooms okay. and and potable water so um, and I, I think uh, Robert could probably speak to the <laughs> lack of seating. Um, yeah. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I was going to bring it up during my thing, but um, <laughs> um, just like the lack of, so yeah, lack of seating. So as you know, the student section was lowered to just seniors and juniors. Um, a lot of people now stand on that hill instead of the actual seating. Um, the visitor side is pretty good. That never really 
gets overwhelmed. It's more the home side, and it's really emphasized with the students. I feel like the parents most of the time can get a good place to sit, but the student section is so small compared to um, the rest of the stands that it's just like a, a massive clump of students plus the band, plus all the parents, that it, it kind of overwhelms that area and people have to stand on the hill. <coughs> um, but there's a lot of people in that small space during Friday nights. There are porta potties now, right? Down by the, by the parking lot? Um, I know they have one porta potty yeah, at that. Field 3. We have uh, two porta potties up by, so what we call the, the amenities building is what we now call the doghouse that will be. It would be like right. in the same It would add place. bathrooms to the doghouse, essentially, okay. is my understanding. Yeah. Um, and right next to it, kind of, there's a gate that allows emergency vehicles onto the field, and on the other side of that is two porta potties right now. Um, we also open the bathrooms in the back of the middle school, right. but you have to walk kind of up and pretty far away and um, all that. So, yeah, I know that, you know, I, I could also bring up that, uh, you know, graduation we've been doing outside, yeah. we really like it, and we had a lot of people speak up with take issue, like there was not a lot of opportunities there to use restrooms. So um, there are other events that happen down there where it would be really helpful and beneficial. Yeah, graduation, we hear a lot from grandparents who would, yeah. you know, sort of struggle to get all the way to yeah. the school. Yeah. We also, you know, Relay for Life is a wonderful event we hope to get back to when that happens down there. It's overnight, um, things like that. So, and, and Robert was correct about the student section. I think um, it would be wonderful to have a large uh, section for all our students. Um, and also, we have a lot of middle school and elementary students, youth groups. And on the one hand, it's wonderful that we have such great turnout. On the other hand, it's posing a lot of challenges with kids running around up on field one, down on the turf. We have a strategy for tomorrow. It's a lot because there's nowhere for them to sit. We can't say, go sit down. Um, so they're kind of milling around. Um, tomorrow, we have a really big game. Um, and our band kind of takes one night off a season. And they're taking that one off. So we actually might fit our high school students mostly up there for a change. Um, and so that we're, I'm looking forward to that for our underclassmen. Um, but yeah, this year they've been put off to the hill and then are kind of milling around. And it's hard being a part of that student section. Robert can't speak to it because he's on the field getting the job done. But um, <laughs> it kind of keeps them engaged. And um, they're with their friends. And so when they're not there, they become a larger concern for supervision as well. So that's a big part of my hope in expanding that. So once we do the seating, you have to do. Yeah. The, the, the restroom facilities. So it's an all or nothing. We can't do. Yeah, because yeah. It, it, it's code. Yeah. Um, the reason we can get away with the Porta Johns now is the track's 18 years old. Yeah. So we're following the code that existed then, which probably right. was them. And the number of people which existed then in the right. Hopkinton Public Schools, which was like a thousand people less, a thousand right. fewer fam, two thousand yeah. you know parents per kid that come to the games, and I think that's the piece that. This just reinforces as a grow another growing pain. I mean, in addition to the track being old and the fields um, needing some help, you have another thousand students who want to come and watch their teams and and participate in these community events that are you know you get half the town is at the field on a Friday night, which is awesome and the energy is great. But if you don't have a place for people to use the bathroom, that creates an issue. We need to address these changes. I think, you know, I think some folks. When they see these numbers and they're like, oh, we're doing that for the athletic field, what about the HVAC, what about, but I mean, this is a big community gathering spot mm -hmm. and it's not just games. Like you said, there's so many other events that happen there that um, are community events that need these amenities. And 20 years ago, that might not have been the case, but 20 years ago, we also didn't have over 4,000 students. So this is an important part of the growing process is all of the amenities have to be updated to accommodate that growth. So yeah. I appreciate all your efforts to try to balance all that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't share too, just some safety concerns in general. You know, yeah. we have a beautiful campus and you know, the aerial shot is gorgeous through the trees. Um, but there's a lot of challenges that come with having a woodsy campus of field um, and a lack of lighting. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we have this beautiful football event happening and the lights shining on the field, but not the peripheral where all of our children are hanging out. Right. The 14 um, to 18 yeah. year old crowd hanging out mm -hmm. in the woods is mm -hmm. a concern. Of, I'm weird, large, right? Large, you know, right. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's another thing to be addressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The 11 to 13 up there. Well, yeah, the, the, eight, the 8 to 18 crowd. But yeah. even, even our cute little five and six year olds, yeah. they see a tackling right. dummy up on field one by the woods and we have to move those and you can't really see it happening up there. and. You know, it's it's a lot to keep an eye on. You know, Tim's been helpful. We're trying to get some lights up there and partner with parents to help us be there with their kids if they're at the game and all that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the field itself, um, 
it's pretty pitched because it's a grass field and it's dangerous. Um, I grew up in Holliston and we played soccer on that field and lost some ACLs to it. <laughs> it has to be pitched like that for, for weather and all that, but the turf doesn't need that steep pitch. So uh, for our athletes as well as our spectators, it's just, um, it would be a wonderful thing to be able to do. Any other questions on turf? <laughs> I, have, I, don't, I don't know specifically about turf, but where, are, we gonna, are we planning to do this in the off season? Because otherwise, where are all these folks going to be? Where are all our students <laughs> going to play question. football and That's play tra and run track? And so the, the tricky thing, um, and this, this is where it gets difficult, where you look at a capital plan in the fall. Yeah. You do not get funding for that until May. Right. Right. In order to get anything done in the summer, you have to really have it bid out before yeah. you get the funding. It sounds like we're um, going to lose a season. For so, a <laughs> well, it, it, so to realistically do this in this summer, mm -hmm. you would have to have this out to bid in January, which okay. would mean you would have to find design and engineering money now yeah. to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and then if that was the case, if you were able to bid it out, and if it did pass town meeting, however the funding, whether it's CPC or town meeting, um, the actual construction probably still would fall into the fall. Yeah. And so we've already been speaking about if you were to lose a month of the season, where would the kids go to practice? Where would those, you know, would you schedule the first half of the season as away games, you know? Yeah. So we've already been talking about that kind of a strategy. But the, di the biggest issue is you always need your money before town meeting yeah. in order for it to get accomplished in the summer. Right. I've learned a lot about all of these things <laughs> and, about, and about town meeting and how that can be complicated. And yes. So I'm, I very much appreciate how much thought you are all putting into all of these moving pieces. Thank you. So question that just came to my mind as you were speaking. So is the... Um, like the engineering money and design money in the ask here or is that going to be something separate that it's in there now okay and there's probably not a way to do that it's probably a lot that we wouldn't be able to figure that out to do that before the the time. only um opportunity that you would have is the central office gift account okay. which is money that comes from the BAA and the 26.2 foundation and that is money that is specifically designated for athletics okay so there, there might be an opportunity both to if this if, if we want to advance this to do that piece ahead of time which would then lower the ask a little bit at town meeting correct okay. how would you be able uh, what at what point would you know that you could do something like that like we're talking about this tonight, we're not voting on it tonight. So if this is something that the school committee, depending on how the school committee votes for any, all, whatever of the capital plan, um, the school committee could also vote to use the gift money from the 26.2 uh, and the BAA to fund the design and engineering of the the turf field. Thank you. Is there anyone else who's shown up or anyone who? No. <laughs> there were a couple of friends that, that popped in and I think <laughs> very quickly were like, oh, I clicked the wrong thing and they, but they will remain, it'll be just between them and me. <laughs> so, a question uh, in terms of like looking at the process of this, that when does the CPC make their decisions? So I have not heard, um, okay. they will set public hearings. Yep. Um, so they had a meeting a week or two ago and just reviewed all the applications that they received. And then we will get notice that they will have a hearing okay. of all the projects um, and then they'll make their decisions. I haven't looked at their exact timeline. I imagine their hearings will be soon, though. But so it, we, by January, for example, we would know that. I agree. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Anything else on um, turf? And I have a question on um, the Hopkins edition. 
So oh, okay. thank you so much. No, no, no. Please. So I'm looking at the the 2019 uh, DRA. Um, what you put up on the screen with in terms of the space. Where do the portable classrooms fit in, and is there a possibility that we might need less space than what we're looking? Is there a possibility that we don't quite need as big of an addition as this, or is this really absolutely what we need, even if we moved portable classrooms from Elmwood or whatnot? It is are? absolutely a number from there. <laughs> so back in 2019, I believe it was roughly 19,000 square feet yep. that was identified. Um, so roughly 20,000, yep. and I just tagged on another 10,000 yep. to allow for whatever grade configuration we're looking yep. at. But this is what we're relying on Perkins Eastman to tell us. Okay. So, so you... things to keep in mind, yes, we would pull the portables over. We would also have the opportunity to use Legacy Farms money that is in that stabilization reserve. So there are things that will impact that number, but at this point in time, we do need to have some type of a placeholder, and that was the best science that's, that's, that I that's, could use at the time. That answers exactly what I was yes. getting at. So thank you. One of the other things I'll say is that, and you know, sort of learning this with the Elmwood project, is that you know they'll come and sit with Ann Carver and me and ask questions like, you know, how many students would you want in a classroom? Would you want this kind of classroom, that kind of classroom? Would you want this kind of music room, that kind of art room? So I think the number that Mrs. Rodmick is talking is also going to be impacted by some of the work that we do with Athena. What kind of programming do you want to bring into that space as well? Yes. Excellent. And I, I think, too, what I have heard from people in the community frequently is that they do want to see us planning out um, mm -hmm. and not having to keep coming yeah. back for Correct. two classrooms or four. But. Correct. I lied. Mine's a marathon question. <laughs> but, I, but I love that we have Hopkins. This I think this has um, been on our radar. So I'm really glad that as much of an art as it had to be to get it on this um, this capital plan, I'm really glad that we've got it on there. And we'll massage it as we go if we pass it as a committee. But um, yeah. it's such an important um, place where we are just getting pinched. Yeah, so, I, I mean, mean it's yeah, it's yeah. been one of our biggest questions, right? Yeah. Is Oh, we have Elmwood. Oh, it becomes, you know, three grades. But that means Hopkins still needs to be two. <laughs> we mm -hmm. still can't fit two. So how do we systematically design all of our school buildings to, to, to work correctly if we have one building that just cannot handle any of the capacity that we need to have in it? And we're not going to have a one grade building. Like that would just be... <laughs> Um, yeah, so as much as that number is, is a little frightening, <laughs> I think, for, for, you know, any voter who's looking at, at money, you know, like, it, we're sort of out of options, mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to do two more modulars. So, yeah. Right. And as we say all the time, it's not just about the classrooms, because right. the cafeteria is undersized. Exactly. Absolutely. And if you were to say that would become a 5-6 school and we talk about well that's the time when instrumental music starts or at the middle school now sixth graders have access to so many related arts opportunities what will that building look like to accommodate a 5-6 grade level if that turns out to be what it is right. go ahead marathon yeah. <laughs> so I know we're talking fiscal year 24 but I did see a placeholder in fiscal year 25 for a central office, preschool, 18 to 22 um, potential building. Um, so as we're thinking about the marathon playground, again, fully appreciating the enrollment growth and the constraints, um, what, what is that project placeholder next year? And could that impact um, playground demand at marathon if we're moving the pre-K? It's a future state out. I just want to understand kind of what that is because it was the first time I'd seen it. Um, when I just looked in 25 and I thought, oh, what is that? You know, how does that relate? Yeah, so the fiscal year 25, the placeholder that you see is for um, preschool, central office. As you know, we're renting facilities for all the central office staff and the 18 to 22 program, which is currently housed in the White House. One of the thoughts potentially when Perkins Eastman does the district impact study, in order to not have to continue to put additions on Marathon, 
the thought would be that maybe if you pull the preschool out, that would give that facility room for growth without another addition. Um, so that is, again, kind of the thing that will be further defined as we go along in this district impact study. Um, so, but again, even if you were to pull the preschool out, so if that was a request in 25, then you're talking a three to four year build, so you're out to 29. Um, and again, in terms of the students that are at Marathon, already the pre preschool playground, if, if that's what you're thinking about, is already being utilized by students other than preschoolers. Okay. So we're already utilizing that space, if you will. Yeah. So. so. Yeah, and I think we also have to remember that the four classrooms we're putting on Marathon right now are for the kids who are already here. Right. Yeah. You know. That's so if I, there are more. That's what if, I was going to ask. If, <laughs> if when there are more. If we're talking mm. a build and we're talking yes. 2029, that means that by the time we have the preschool kids out, we may have replaced that number with yes. the with the yeah, other yes. children, right? So yes, exactly. we will be massively over capacity, but even when we remove those children, we'll be back to about where we are right now, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So that is just, you know, what we're thinking is a potential solution to the growth at Marathon without having to do another addition. Right. So you know, in the how that plays out with Perkins Eastman when they define these things will remains to be seen. The, the lease is not inconsequential that we're paying on the central office building. That would presumably really offset the debt service um, if we were able to build that. Well, it, uh, I believe a couple meetings ago, you had uh, approved the lease, yeah. which was 127000 a year yeah. for yeah. Right. this and that, year, and will continue yeah. to grow. Yeah. So, an exciting opportunity as well for expansion of our 18 to 22 program. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. That's really exciting. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else on, oh, I did have actually one on marathon so that the 42 recess periods a day that that's calculating up all the classrooms some maybe have two recesses is that i was trying to figure that's out the correct. number okay. they, have, they have two recesses a okay day. grade yes. one has one okay but kindergarten, kindergarten has two and the reason grade one has one is because they can't put two in because of time, time on learning, learning. yeah sure. and because k isn't compulsory we can let them go out twice that's nice and so the kindergartners we learned tonight the equipment for the preschool playground is only through like five two to five two yeah to five. so it's very so small the kindergartners don't really use that at all then correct okay they don't. okay anything else on marathon anything else on any of the projects um okay i want to say thank you to kylie and ken yeah thank you I don't. And I read through it and I was like, I have a lot of questions. So I'm happy that really knowledgeable, fully prepared people are here to help us. So, in terms of process, um, so we're looking in two weeks that we have to make a, a vote um, on the capital budget for next year. Uh, and it, it does go through a number of different hoops that it has to clear before it comes back um, in the sometime in the winter where we then are looking towards town meeting with it for I'd like to, to do the um, the CPC ones to vote those separately at the next meeting if that's okay and then do the vote the rest of the capital budget together if that's okay and then I, you know I, I'm wondering if we could bring it back for discussion at some point in because some of these projects seem like they're going to evolve a little bit between now and when like say January if we could bring this back for a discussion um, at that point and kind of see where we are if there are adjustments that we have to make or whatnot when we start receiving um, information from Perkins Eastman on that right. impact study that that's something that would be presented to the committee right. anyway okay Anything else? No. Okay. And there's nobody else in our um, in your waiting room there. Just me. Did, did we just one like minor minor project that I don't see listed here? Did we um, have a change with the HMS air conditioning? Did that come off? Yes, it did. Okay. Um, I know you said it may. Oh. Yeah. So um, I can't recall. Oh, when you approved the high school um, mm -hmm. vendor contract. Yeah. 
Um, that's where I was speaking of that Warren article was 475,000. We're using 222,000 for the high school unit. The remaining was to be used for a middle school unit. And I believe the middle school two units and air conditioning came in well over a million dollars. Um, so that is not being brought forward as an additional ask at town meeting. So we'll replace another unit at the middle school with the remaining money. Okay. So that did come off. The 300000 or whatever it was. That's okay. correct. Okay. And if it's 90 degrees on the nights of town meeting. <laughs> I know, that's why I'm smiling yeah, as she says it. It's back school. Because it's like year 20 of that. I'm just trying to get that in there. I don't even, yeah, it's been on there for, there for a long time, and so is you. <laughs> Sorry for laughing while you were talking. That was yep. why. Yeah. Yep. Year 20. Okay, so I think we're good with this for tonight, and we will um, continue to receive feedback from the community between now and our next meeting, which is November 10th, I think. Is that Correct. right? Yes. Is that right? Did she, he said no more questions. No. A anybody else want to come back up from, are you guys good? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> in that case, then I think we can move back um, into our regular business. Uh, okay. Do you want to take you. hockey? I, I was just going to say, if, can we go ahead and do hockey? I mean, I know you're probably hoping to stay till the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. The more the merrier. Welcome and welcome back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for um, you know allowing me to speak here tonight. My name is Scott Hayes. I'm the head hockey coach of the boys varsity hockey team at Hockington High School and I'm here to request uh, approval for our team to travel overnight this season. We would like to play in the Martha's Vineyard Tournament and it would be a uh, a two-day tournament and a one-night overnight stay on the vineyard. You guys have done that before, is that right? In other <coughs> years, maybe before the pandemic at some point? The program has, but I was hired as the head coach last year, okay. so I have not. Okay. We took a day trip down there last yeah. year on the ferry, and all the kids wanted to go back. They wanted to go back and play in the tournament again, and I'm all for it. Can I ask you a question? I saw it in, well, hello, and thank you for coming. Um, I saw in the intent to travel, um, I think it was check no for fundraising, but under the $120 per student athlete, it was looking into fundraising. And that having um, been an athlete, I know that when you're on a team, you're not going to want to say no. Um, it's hard. You know, you've got teammates and, you know, you're integral um, as a teammate so how are we addressing need and how are we surfacing I guess the first question surfacing need and addressing need financially among the teammates so I think that the the costs will be minimal um, we can you know if we don't fundraise I think that a cost of hundred and twenty dollars per player will be able to cover hotel and some meals for us I put brainstorming fundraising ideas because I mean quite honestly to go off point a little bit I'm from Franklin if you go to the grocery store in Franklin on the weekend you're gonna walk out to a varsity high school athlete that is simply fundraising with a decorated can wearing their game jersey and they'll strike up a conversation with you so when I was speaking with our um, our booster members I was just kind of throwing the question out there, is that something possible where we could take the boys, they understand that it would be fundraising for this tournament, for this opportunity, and could we put them outside of, you know, maybe a Dunkin' Donuts, maybe, you know, a few different coffee places or, or a grocery store <coughs> downtown, and I'm sure the boys would probably, you know, not have, have a problem with doing that. Is there a mechanism for, sorry, a student or a family to discreetly service to you that they have a financial need? Yes. Because even though $120 isn't a lot to some, to others it's food for the week. You Correct. know, so it's, I just want to make sure that we're not excluding any team members because that would be devastating to a team mate, I'm sure. Sure. I, I'll speak to just generally with athletics and if you want to talk about Hillers Hockey. Sure. Hillers Hockey. So um, in an effort to, you know, I don't want to say... Uh, not like fine, but I in every communication I send about registration, all that I'm attaching as best I can. I know a lot of work has been done from my time in the counseling office. 
I know that the district's worked on making uh, paperwork for financial assistance readily available and more user friendly and all those things. So from the start, I'm trying to, rec to identify families that could use assistance early on. Um, certainly if they identify themselves with the registration process, I would, you know, handle that discreetly to support them through this. Um, but I also recognize there's a lot of families that don't qualify for, net, for financial assistance and that 120 is still a lot. So, um, you know, Coach and I have been talking a lot about that. Um, hockey's unique in that they have their own booster. Um, all others go through us, uh, Friends of Hiller Hockey. Um, I don't know if you want to speak more specifically, but have been pretty wonderful in this department. Um, Absolutely. So anything that we, you know, well, let's say a few things that we've done in the past year since I've been here. Um, the Friends of Hiller Hockey have, have always let me know, you know, the message is that if anybody needs help, yes, very discreet, you know, they're welcome to reach out and, you know, they will, those students will be taken care of. And it would That's great. be Coach and okay. I that would be aware of who, okay. no one else would, Booster, wouldn't, they wouldn't have to know who the money is needed for. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Sounds like a great trip. Yeah, yeah. it sounds fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, I move to approve the HHS hockey travel for February 18th to 19th, 2023. Okay. Motion by Leah. Is there a second? Okay. Go ahead, Holly's got Second it. by Holly. <laughs> All those in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 And thank you so much for coming thank in. We you. don't always get to see the coach, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> thank you very much thank for you. having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great season. Yes. Thank you. So that it, we're going to circle back now to reports, uh, and that um, Robert, do you want to head off our reports for the student council? I'd love to. Um, <clears throat> so these past couple of weeks have been somewhat stressful for seniors, as many college applications are due on November first, and then tests and quizzes are kind of in full swing, and grades also get submitted around November first. Um, last Saturday, Huffington High School had a college preparation day where seniors could use the day to write their essays. Um, ask questions about their college application or meet with counselors. Then they also took a small course on stress management and financial literacy. Um, but although all of that's going on, it's still a fun time. And tomorrow will be Senior Halloween, which is a tradition at Hoppington High School for a while now. Seniors dress up in their costumes and during second period, staff vote on which groups have the best costumes. And Mr. Bishop was happy to invite anyone that'd like to attend it. Um, it's at 9.45 in the gym of the high school. Homecoming was two weeks ago and had over 500 kids for two grades. Um, it went very well as it returned for the first time since 2014, and students were able to have a lot of fun, but it was also a very safe environment. It was um, a dance? That was a dance. Right? It was a dance, yes. And then Hoppington Sports are doing very well. Four out of eight of our varsity teams have won TVL Large, the championship. Um, after tomorrow, we'll know if football will join that list because the team is set against Holliston at 7 o'clock on Friday night. For the TVL championship, it's Fox 25's game of the week, and the band has taken the night off, and in exchange, ninth and 10th graders will be able to enjoy, for the first time this year, a student section environment um, where they'll replace the, uh, the band where they usually sit. Um, some important dates for the future are picture retakes are on Friday, November 4th, and the 9th and 10th of November will be MCAS English retakes for anyone who missed it. And then um, Mr. Bishop and I were talking, and I wanted to bring up that if there's anything that you'd like me to dive deeper into in the high school trends going on or how students are liking the new schedule or how students are feeling, I'd be happy to take on a project like that or a survey and return it to you guys. Oh, I would love to hear how this, the schedule is going. Yeah. 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 Um, so the schedule is going good. Sometimes I think people are a little late to classes because though it's kind of like a, a weird thought getting out of class. 30 seconds late or something, yeah. just one class going right up to the bell and then packing up. Sometimes you're late to class, but um, for the most part, teachers are pretty flexible. So I think that's going good. I think everyone's happy. And then lunch lines are back down as well. I wanted to oh, bring that. That's fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think I think everything's going well right now. Everything's in full swing. I have and little, there's still the flex spots. Kids, right? I wanted to ask you what senior transition day is. Or is yeah. that, did I say it right? Because I don't have I'm yeah, a senior, I so I don't know if I need to prepare myself to cry in a few years. Or <laughs> <laughs> years. Um, senior transition day being what, the yeah, thing I brought up. Yeah, yeah. I saw it um, online all the place, and I thought. Yeah, I think it was called senior transition. Day. I called it preparation day, but it was in a, It was on Friday two weeks ago, and it was a half day. Mm -hmm. um, the other grades had to go to the normal classes, but seniors had no classes. 
Instead, the first half of the day was spent, you could go to different, the library, the cafeteria, other rooms were open, and they just had English teachers in college, or not college, um, the counselors, guidance counselors, walking around, helping people if they had questions. Awesome. So that was helpful in helping people finish their essays, which Hopkinton does a good job doing. They really mm -hmm. push you to get your essay done, even at the end of junior year. Um, and then the second half of the day was kind of a cool event. They brought in, they brought in one company. I went to the stress management meeting, and they went over just ways to lower your stress, a bunch of methods, and that was in the auditorium. And then after that, you went to the cafeteria, and they talked about financial literacy. Um, they talked about how they had internship opportunities for anyone that was interested in it, okay. and it was kind of a lot. I didn't really remember it, but they just talked about <laughs> um, investment methods. Um, making sure you start filling your retirement plans early, yeah, getting amazing. on top of stuff like that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Sounds amazing. Thank you. Yeah, we're good. What I would love to hear about is how the flex block is going this year. Flex block's really good. Yeah. I, I really enjoy it. Um, not only because it's just like a gap in the day, which is nice sometimes when you have classes. It's just nice to have a break. Sometimes students just use it to listen to music or watch videos on their computers, but other times it's a good opportunity to catch up on work or if they have a quiz later that day, they can study during flex block. It's really helpful for me this year, especially this year. I've been going to like extra help periods. Um, I go to math, I show up all the time. So that's really helpful and it, it's popular. A lot of people will go to extra help. It's not like a lot of people just don't like it. Um, last year there was kind of an issue where people were walking around or leaving the school and going to get food. That's not the case anymore because people have to sign up on adaptive scheduler now, which is a setting on power school. So it's organized and it's, it's really good. It's going well. That's great. Have you been in the beautiful library much? We got a chance to see the new library. It looks phenomenal. Yes, it is good. And they added a bunch of outlets, yeah. which is really helpful. <laughs> it's true, though. It's yeah. important. I, I can speak as somebody over here. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Then that um, moves us into, I believe, the superintendent's report. Okay. Uh, so the superintendent's report for Thursday evening, October 27th. Um, I will start with some congratulations to our national merit semifinalists, mm -hmm. uh, Neil Abraham, Eli Calcagni, Albert Chen, Margaret Joyce, and Jeffrey Wang have all been uh, named semifinalists. Fabulous. Hmm. All right, this is for the community. Next Wednesday evening, November 2nd at 6.30 p.m. in the Hopkinton High School Auditorium, there will be the second Elmwood School Project in-person community forum. Uh, people can participate remotely if they wish to do that. Uh, very briefly on this flyer is the agenda for the night. So we will be just recapping very quickly the first, the content of the first community forum. Uh, we will be looking at, you know, what are the needs of the sites and what are the needs of the school program as we're going through this process. We have to, according to the MSBA, go through a renovation study. And all that means is that you would take the Elmwood School as it exists today and say, what would it cost to upgrade things like electrical or you know, HVAC or all, plumbing, all of that, um, and just kind of produce a dollar figure on that um, in sort of a scope of work. And um, this, I think, is the most exciting thing that will happen. So we are now down to just a few sites, and we will be able to show people what the test fit school looks like as it sits on those particular sites. This is going to be like an amazing unveiling for people, so <laughs> they should tune in for that. And then finally, um, just the system-wide considerations, and so we'll be talking about how grade configurations could possibly work, just to bring people up to speed on that. So I think that will be a really interesting community forum. It is, you know, I say all the time, it's starting to heat up, but it's getting juicier as we go. <laughs> um, for those people who <laughs> did not make it to the first community forum or who did not catch the last ESBC2 meeting um, in, in person, you can always go back and watch these on HCAM. So that's my plug for HCAM and my thanks to HCAM to, um, Ed for airing those. It looked like the last forum got a lot of uh, views on the, the replay. I think so, yeah. yes. Every once in a while, Georgette will take a look at that for us. And yeah, it's good to see that people are interested. Um, last night in the middle school library, we had the Elmwood School Visioning Group meet. And I think we had uh, just under 30 people who were sort of volunteers. There were folks from appropriations, the select board, our town manager, the school committee. Uh, we had... Um, 
reached out to the senior center and we had a, a senior volunteer we have a high school volunteer so I've gone a long way to say that there's like a really nice broad selection of people from across the community and I think people felt like the evening was engaging and we really heard a lot of voices I think the the activity you see in those pictures with the tiles was really nice because people could talk about sort of their hopes and dreams for the new school and thought that was lovely uh, the Hopkinton High School yes. Library renovation yeah. is complete and um, it's, it's really beautiful in there and now the furniture is all in as well. I mean I think if you look at those tables that are kind of coming out from the wall with the orange chairs and that middle photo, um, you can see that there are screens set up at all of those. So if kids are working collaboratively on something, one person's laptop can be up there and everyone can be watching you know, the, the changes in real time. Or the, I mean it feels almost like a college library. It feels yeah. beautiful in there. Because we got to we got a sneak peek uh, <laughs> after the NHS induction ceremony. Yes. We were um, we were let in by someone with a key, and uh, it was it was phenomenal. <laughs> it was to break we didn't break in. Break in. <laughs> we didn't break in. But it really does feel like a college space. It, it really like a learning commons. It has a great mm -hmm. vibe and um, very functional, very versatile. You can move things around. It was really I was really impressed. Mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Yeah, you can even see with that piece of furniture on the right hand side. You know that table can be broken into three pieces right. so if you want to work independently or collaboratively that piece of furniture allows you to do it yeah. it's just a great space yeah. so Robert where are the plugs uh, in between those tables on the left with the orange seats oh yeah. in between each one yeah, like into the floor so yeah. I think there's, there's like four outlets and each outlet has two that's huge right mm -hmm. yep <laughs> and kids can go in there during like free periods or flex time or before and after school or yeah school. um sometimes it's closed after school but a lot of the time Students will be in there um, just during their studies, yeah. um, during primarily during studies because there's not really a lot of walking around during flex period. Um, beforehand, if they the the librarian will open the library up to students who want to do projects in there. If you email them before school, they'll allow it you to walk in there. Um, but it's it's full throughout the whole day just with studies. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Great spot. Well, and that's all I have for you. Questions? But a lot of great news tonight. It is great. Yeah. 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 Right. No, I have no questions. I asked them as we went, I guess. Yeah. Great. Okay. Then that brings us into the school committee chair report and just wanted to say that payroll warrant S23008 has been approved, warrants 23 017, 23 018, and 23 018. 019 have been approved and they're all included in the packet. Do people have liaison reports? Mine was already covered. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's the tough thing. You do a lot of work for that. But it <laughs> I, I do. Um, uh, the uh, Dr. Carafinal already shared the event um, from Hopkinton Youth and Family Services through a uh, school messenger email. I do want to highlight that they're having drop in hours, which is something kind of new and happy about it because you know sometimes you need some help after school and they're Wednesdays at the library from 2 to 4 30 so it's a, a central non-school place which I think is also awesome and I also um, am now the chair of the turf committee and I learned a lot about turf that I had no <laughs> no knowledge of before um, but we talked about the rentals as we mentioned and we have a request from a college and um, there was a lot of factors that go into it that I was not aware of so now if somebody wants to talk to me about turf maintenance I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Prior <I> did, not. <laughs> did you think you'd be learning that when you joined the school committee? No. I, I think I, like I am open to all new adventures. Okay. <laughs> so you know so that's it. Anybody else? No. Okay then that brings us, i got to scroll down our Perkins contract, right? You've made it to policy? Yep. yep. Okay. So I, I think actually we're not doing that tonight. We're going oh. to do the policy JH. Is that, am I correct on that? Yes, but we have two policies on. I don't know if we want to address both. But the first one we have on is JH attendance. Okay. Okay. So when the policy working group met, you can see from the red lining on the document, we looked at our former opening paragraph and it felt wordy and it didn't offer sort of the same clarity that some of the other um, school districts policies on, on attendance had. So, uh, 
sort of shamelessly, we have borrowed from the Framingham Public Schools. <laughs> and we really liked their opening. Um, we liked, one of the things we liked was that it states outright that consistency consistent attendance practices in the early years of a child's education really contribute to the continuity of ed education um, and attendance throughout the child's years in Hopkinton. Uh, and while, you know, I often say we see that anecdotally, you know, we've never done sort of that hard and fast research, we can speak to the fact that when kids have spotty attendance as, as younger kids, they tend to have the same problem as they, they grow older in our schools. Um, we like that the Mass General Law is in there, that the objective is that every student attends school every day on time for the full day. Um, there's a lot of legal language in here and one piece of that is that we can excuse kids up to seven days in, a, um, in any six period, in any six month period or um, 14 times in a half day session in a six month period. We tend to send a letter to our families on day five to let them know that their child has accrued five absences. Um, and then of course we have to provide parents and guardians with instructions for calling their child sort of out of school um, for the day. So all of that is in there and we thought it was very succinct and, and uh, very clear. Uh, the second thing is been here all the time. What are the conditions under which kids don't have to go to school? And that would be a chronic or long-term illness or quarantine, bereavement, and weather so inclement that a parent would feel like their child was endangered. And that does happen sometimes on snow days. You know, a, a parent would call and say, I know there's school, but I'm just not feeling comfortable about sending my child today, which is fine. Uh, religious holidays and any other exception that if a parent has a conversation with the building principal. Um, that, that can be excused. Um, the extended absence, if a family is going away or um, a child is, is not well, um, we it would expect that a parent would notify the building principal when a child is going to be out for five days. Um, reasons why we would not allow a child to have attendance in our school is if they have graduated from somewhere else and we did actually have this happen, so a child had graduated from a high school in another country moved to Hopkinton, enrolled here for a year as a senior. And of course, it's, it's an attractive thing to do because you're not only immersing yourself in the language, but also academic language, but it's, it's just not allowed. Um, failure to meet age requirement, um, you don't actually reside in, in the community, all of those kinds of things. We do have an attendance officer, and the last part does tell us that it's a crime for a parent not to send their child to school, which again falls under the law. So and that's it. One random comment sure. on the equity front. Um, there are even community colleges here that will not accept a graduation from another country at a high school level. I had a cousin who went through this and had a lot, a really hard time getting into a community college or even a college because they wouldn't accept proof of high school graduation from another country. Wow. I know that's not our problem per se, but it would explain somebody sure. coming into a high school and wanting a degree from here yes. so that they could move on to college. Super ease of transition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my other question was the extended as absence thing. It says that school district will not be responsible for curriculum instruction or assessments missed during that absence. That is correct. So. Uh, Going extreme here, <laughs> child has, I don't know, cancer or something really, really hard. Oh, that's covered that's under different. the law. Yeah. Okay, that's a different yeah, yeah. Yeah. thing. Okay, that's what I was trying to understand. Thank you. Perfect. But a vacation, a family trip, that it's not incumbent upon the district. To yeah, yeah. Prepare. Okay, yeah. I, I was just worried more about what yeah. kind of critical extended absences, yeah. but if they're covered somewhere else, that's great. Okay. So I think everybody knows what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, with being consistent with 12 other states and the proposal that is in front of our state legislature, it's in a package of other educational proposals. Um, I would like to, if we can, have a discussion about mental health as an excused absence. As it is written in the proposed, the bill that has been proposed, it's 
two excused mental health absences per six months. So there is a limit. Um, as a mental health professional, um, if we can put language like this within our policies, we are destigmatizing, discussing mental health within our schools. We are acknowledging that often mental health is self-care, um, which is something that we, you know, talk about a lot as mental health care providers. We are acknowledging that our students can have stress about being in the school building and sometimes um, you just need to not be there and it doesn't necessarily mean that the building is a toxic place. It's just, uh, you know, a number of things going on in any student's life. Um, we can build trust with our students um, and we do have a lot of language about whole child education and whole child wellness and we all know that mental health is a critical piece of our total well-being so i know that as a person that like does does this all the time i i talk about it a lot and maybe you would like me to talk about it less and that is fine <laughs> <laughs> my children would also like that um so you know i just wanted to have a discussion about support or not support and hear uh, what anybody that has an opinion has to say. Uh, so can I jump in? Because I, I also talk about mental health yes, a lot. Yes, yes, um, do. My, in terms of this iteration of the policy, my understanding is this actually was done before you had brought the that at the future when we did right, the future agenda items. Yeah, yeah. And so that feedback didn't have the opportunity to be incorporated in, in any kind of a way in this iteration of that. Okay. Correct. Correct. All right. So I, it was not that it, I, I don't think intentionally. I didn't left it. I didn't yep. propose that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. I just thought it was yep. a discussion that we could have since it is yes. A, yes. a discussion in the broader national like, it, you know, atmosphere, socio-political atmosphere. And when we were talking about the agenda, my recommendation would, was that we actually have that conversation to incorporate the, the feedback and the important things that you brought a couple weeks ago. Now my timeline is yeah. fading. Um, just in terms of, I, I do think your point about also just destigmatizing mental health by talking about it mm. um, is an important thing that we can do for our students. Yeah. And with our focus on social emotional learning, right, you would want to show that that's part of the thought process, even in this sort of situation. Can I ask a question yeah. about among practitioners, because I'm not one. And so one of the things that I, I worry about is a, well, let's just take a high school student yeah. or a middle school student who, you know, is having that mental, um, that mental health you know, crisis or it just is just not able, feels unable to engage in the school day for whatever reason and says to a parent, well, I get two days. I get two mental health days. Mm -hmm. At the secondary level, a lot of parents are working. There are a lot of parents, families where the, both parents are out of the house or at least they were before the pandemic. I think things are all still trans transitioning. But I do worry about providing that sort of aspect of this policy to the student who will then be home alone right. on a day when they are feeling, you know, unable to cope for whatever reason or having issues. I contrast that with all the, the resources in the school. Like you can go to school with a pass and maybe go to the start room or go to maybe not engage in the school day, but go to the school to access the resources who are there to support just that kind of thing, which I personally am much more comfortable with. Yeah. Like I'd rather have an excuse in-house absence where you come and you have um, available some of the, you know, the transitional programs that we offer. The idea of being home alone or the opportunity to create an opportunity to be home alone when you're in that state um, worries me a lot. I also have a question. Um, about the two days so our policy right now reflects the law yeah which says that kids can have seven excused days in a six month period mm -hmm. and i think now kids probably i mean they can use them for the i'm feeling a little under the weather with a tummy ache or uh, this is just a day that i just can't face school right, right? that kind of, so 
if they were to add two days for mental, would that make the seven days go to nine? Is that the legislation? So the, the I think it's of the days that we get, two can be used for mental health. That was my understanding. I am not a lawyer, so when I read legal documents, my brain kind of like, you know. So um, I, and I also would assume that would be a uh, district discretion as if we, already have an allowance of seven days we could say up to two of those can be used as mental health days and i understand and respect where you're coming from um i would i would say that the work based on the work that i've done children that are in crisis are often already connected to the resources that we have right within school and out of school <coughs> we are improving on the way that we offer these resources to students right we've added social worker we have community social workers that are now offering out of school drop-in hours so um my concern wouldn't necessarily be a student in crisis taking the day off i'm when when i did reading and research about this we're talking about you know i'm going to use you for a sec robert <laughs> like has applied to 10 colleges he has written all of his essays he is um, writing reports for the school committee and he's just like how about Friday no I need to reset myself I need to balance mm -hmm. I want to not be in that building I do not want to write another thing for the stupid school committee like I want to be <laughs> you know away from everything mm -hmm. a student in crisis is like something that is completely different okay. um, and Nancy could probably speak to this as well because she does crisis work all day um, we that looks different that feels different a student in crisis probably wouldn't ask for the day off from school they probably wouldn't be the one saying I'm having um, I feel like I'm in danger because that wouldn't be like okay have a day off that would be we're going to the ER right the the idea of offering kids the ability to set their own boundaries and create self-care in a way that works for them is something that is a social emotional skill that they will use for a lifetime um, and this is something that we probably teach within our schools um, I know my children have come home with what I can do when I feel overwhelmed what I can and this is these mental health days are not going to work for everybody mm -hmm. some people thrive in a school environment and they want right. to be around more people when they're feeling overwhelmed some people just want to lay in their bed and watch trashy TV and eat <laughs> Cheetos right like yeah. we have a spectrum when, when we're talking about children in crisis, that is something separate from this particular policy. And I, I know that our school counselors are very well trained to recognize and intervene in these situations. And it, it also, you know, we've had a lot of education around suicide, suicidal ideation, um, stress management, what, what parents can do. We have a lot of literacy education this is something that I know our school is continuing to do and continuing to build on. And I think that we're in an excellent place for our students and our parents and our all of our staff to kind of be able to delineate between a child that is in crisis and should not be alone and needs to be in emergency services versus a kid that is overwhelmed that would not be productive in school and just needs a little bit of time to not be in school. <laughs> ideally, so ideally, but I, I definitely have read a lot about um, particularly advanced or you know, high performing kids who mask really, really well and it goes undetected mm -hmm. yeah. until it's too late. You know, I just, I mean, I think that little, those high performing kids are going to say, I'm going to take a day off in school. That's, I guess, that's I the question. I have no idea. I, I don't know, but I do appreciate that we allow us to use our unwell days in whatever way you're unwell. Mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. I think it's at the discretion of the child, the family, whatever, mm -hmm. to figure out how to use those unwell days. And I yeah. think, you know. Well, then we we're not talking about something different. Right. We're, we're talking about the same thing. It's the language for me that is important that we put mental health as part of our unwell days, right? Because it's, it's you're saying, like, I'm, you want parents to have the discretion of when our children will be able to accept education and be a productive member of their class versus they need 
the space to do whatever, decompress, right? So for the important piece for me is actually putting in, we value your mental health, and if that is part of what your unwellness is, then we support that as well. So I, I, I think a couple things. One is I, I, my concern with the two days is that it, it limits that, it, right. that there are yeah. kids and who, that need it, it, in, right. it, it, what I'm thinking is that a kid who overwhelms, you know, in, in September might overwhelm over something else again yeah. in October, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, coming up towards finals in December, and the kid needs something, but it's not there. Yeah. The other thing, I'm jumping around a little bit, the other thing I'm thinking about is in terms of the start room is kids who are not already um, accepted into the start room program can't access the resources there. Yeah. Uh, so that's a separate issue. But I'm wondering if we can take the language and maybe add in a section about those um, seven days and, and some examples examples of things that are included in this yeah. seven days would, would be that. um, acute illness, stomach, but you know, whatever, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, that's, mental health. I think that's what's confusing, right? There's yeah. seven days that you can do for anything, and then after that, the right. excused absences are what's on the list right yeah. there. But right now it just says excused absences are, and then earlier it says you can have up to whatever seven excused absences. So it looks like the definition of an excused absence is just these things. Yeah, I agree but, with that. So if, we, if we shifted it to say those first seven excused absences are sort of whatever. Because they're the unexcused. Practice, yeah. That's very difficult to do. Okay. Because if you say I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to excuse a a cold. I'm going to excuse a sore throat. I'm going to excuse. Eventually, you get to a place where now you've got this this wild checklist. What what typically happens is the school nurse makes the call. We always leave it to a medical professional. So if a mom calls and says, my child is just really exhausted today and kind of unable to come to school, we say okay. okay. Or if they call and say, you know, my child has you know a terrible stomach ache and and just can't whether it's physical or kind of that emotional, we, we still say that that's okay. I, I feel like if we start to try to delineate it, we, it's a slippery slope. That's, that's I think, the problem of practice for us in the schools. Yeah. And I, I, I completely understand that reading through this is a lot of legal, it's a lot of, a legal. Lot of legal wording and um, I just feel like we're gonna have if we're if we're talking to our children about your whole entire self is valued and important and we only list really physical ailments or bereavement right we we call out specifically you know chronic long-term illness bereavement like these things um and i and just to be fair, me mental illness can be long-term illness. Mm -hmm. Right, but yeah. it's not, it's not, it, if you, if you're a person that's not like inundated with it all the time, like I'm sure you are and you know, people that work in the field, you're not gonna automatically assume that mental health is a piece of it. So, and I really but, like what you said and in including it in some language. It, like it doesn't have to be the two days it doesn't have to be just for mental health and saying like as a part of this policy i would love to have mental health called out specifically is it better be place simple, for the handbook so, well, it could I be just as simple as adding it in this so those things that you just read that bulleted list mm -hmm. i mean when we think of illness many of us go automatically to the physical illness realm and so i understand that's where your stigma piece is coming from but if we just added the words chronic or long-term physical or mental illness or quarantine would that be a way to say i i actually think we're talking about two totally different things i think that what holly is talking about is the the seven unexcused days right, right. and so that would ex include it right. like that's not what's on this list because these right. are right. These, you could have 20 of those. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. We don't have, but we, we don't, don't include a list of the unexcused. We don't, days. but things that, from my, I, I, we all know I have four kids and I may have some extensive experience in, in <laughs> the <laughs> excused versus unexcused absences. A, acute illnesses like a 24 hour bug, um, a cold, things that are short in duration are not considered excused. They're considered part of your seven days. 
Right. I guess my vision would be that maybe we could somehow, and I don't have the language at this yeah. point in the night, to call out how it could be, but that there could be some examples right. of days that are not considered excused, but that are considered maybe in a nicer way, uh, that are considered part of the seven-day bank. That right. if your child has a it has a you know vomiting, if your child is you know a, a, anything that we want to call out in addition to mental health that might cause a child not to be in school short term. But yeah. I that think is, that's what she was it. saying about the slippery slope. You have to start listing right. on the well, things. But you can also put like some kind of bucket thing. Well, we're talking about physical right. health. Can we say acute, acute physical, physical? But that first part doesn't talk about any anything. health. It right. just says you can be excused for se seven days in a six month period. It doesn't mention mental health, physical health. I'm too tired, I have a toothache, none of those things are there. Right, yeah. I think... I think when you get to the next part, the excuse part, even when we're talking about elementary kids, that's not too big a deal. Because if you go past your seven days and you get to day eight and we say, well, we're not going to excuse that because you're, you're whatever, unless your, your child has, was it bereavement? No. Was it this? No. Whatever. So at the high school level, it makes a really big difference because then there's loss of credit. Right. So that's why I think we're really careful about saying how many times can you excuse an absence before it starts your attendance starts to be a problem. Yeah. But I, would say I that think the oh. the policy just is confusing in the sense that it's saying excusing up to seven days yeah. and then underneath there's a list of but excused absences. So like they're really making not excused. something right, yeah. but making something clear about these seven days like are a completely absence. different yeah. than the idea of an excused absence. Right. So say you're a high school kid and it's December and you've already missed six days of school and you know they're like, Okay, you're getting really close to like loss of credit situation and you know, then there's a death in your family, so you're out for two days and then you get, you know, a bellyache. The reason those two days aren't going to count, like those two days are important to you as excused absences. Do you right. know what I mean? Right. No, no, the I totally agree. Uh, all I'm saying is correct. So you've yeah. only hit seven right. because right. we've removed those two bereavement days. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, like, all I'm trying to say really is important. that the definition is confusing right. within the policy. Because it, it, it says like one's defined and one isn't you know, right. right. Like one because the the thing is it says um, may excuse up to seven days. So then when you read they really excused didn't excuse absences <laughs> or tardiness, you you start to think that's the definition of what you excuse for yeah. those seven days. And really, because of no, the word yeah, excuse right. being used so often in so many different contexts. So if if there could be a way to clarify that those seven days are a different, different. grouping of saying. days from the excused days. I think that would clarify the policy and, and kind of touch yeah. on, yeah, these yeah. are for, for okay. other stuff, right? Um, I, I think you're spot on. It's That's what's getting all of us caught up into what we're talking about right. here. It's, it's two it's separate, or it seems like two separate yeah. buckets right. to fill, right? And I, so even if we added language about physical or mental health, they would still be on excuse days. They, they would, but it would be an yes. example yeah. of, right. it, you, <laughs> yeah. you could yeah. say in some way that an example of, you know, these, these, seven, these days. seven days might be acute right. physical illness, because I do think some people think those are excused. Right, right. Acute physical <laughs> illness, you know, acute mental illness, or other. Right, okay. right. So because you, chronic mental and chronic physical could be excused. Right. Right. Yeah. Be excused. They're, I, they're unexcued. I mean, it, maybe it's like they're not excused. They're only excused they're, if they're chronic they're or long term. They're except, we, the, right, but right. it says I understand up yeah. too. And so that's that's yeah. what I, I think that piece should right. come out. Like if you're diabetic and you know you're going through a bad time, we excuse all of those. Right, right. I, I sorry, sorry the total, like it's part of this, but it isn't. But since we've been talking mental health, and I want to say the high school does a really good job with like my son would get anxiety mm -hmm. for a test or whatever and he could just walk right down to the counselor and could sit in the counselor's yeah, office right for counselor. hours while the counselor helped him yeah. calm down. So so at least those resources yeah. are really wide open right. and and super like helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I know Gabriel had just moments where he was like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Go down to the counselor and the counselor helped them 
kind of find his way back. That's and then wonderful. Yeah. It, it and I is, do although I do that. think that as our enrollment has grown, it, it does put a challenge the on the, on the yeah. caseload of our adjustment yeah, counselors. That's yeah. true but too. I think that's part of that. Like, so for me, like I'm, I'm curious how you feel, how anyone feels about the statement. Our objective is that every student attends school every day on time for the full day. I like think, I, I, I think actually that's think, ableist, honestly. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, but this is a, this is an interesting question. I think it's kind of getting at what you're talking about. Like, yeah. you know, for me, I think that I would like to see this that be possible. That we yeah. have the resources yeah. that would um, enable and actually encourage students to come to school every day, and we've got you. Like, yeah. you, know, you know what yeah. I mean? And so, for me, that sentence is policy like that's what i would want in policy but i'm not hearing that that is actually something that you would want a policy like no because well, so we always go for the optimal right like when people write goals or building principles they'll say we want to make sure 100 percent of our kids are reading a benchmark yeah now the likelihood of that is very very small yeah but and they'll say should i not write this because it's not a realistic goal and i say no i want you to write it that way yeah, right. because that is our hope Right. You know, it would be wonderful if every kid could get into school every single day. Yeah. We know that the rea yeah. reality of that yeah. is not. But, but maybe every single day with a caveat on like, like, you know, I don't know, healthy or, you know, like, I don't want a kid going into school every single day who's suffering in school. Every, every yeah. single day right. that they're physically right. and mentally. Right. You know. right. Yeah. Every, right. You want a kid to be there every single day in good spirits and good health and good like there's all these things like I there are studies about learning acquisition in schools like ours that have supports but as we're growing maybe our supports don't cover as much of the student population as we need it to right so if a, if our we have a student that has like whatever going on in their life and their their remedy for it is to take a day away from this building they don't want to talk to anybody in the building Maybe the people that are available to them, they don't find particularly helpful and they have their own counselor or support at home. Like the giving, giving that student the option could make the difference between like sitting through a class and getting everything and sitting through a class and getting nothing. So I just want there to be some language within this policy <coughs> that acknowledges that our students have different needs and for them to be able to be there and be present and fully attain what they need to obtain or attain, um, it looks different for every student. And as a person that has suffered from chronic illness for my whole life, I know that policies like these are difficult to read because I did miss a lot of school as a child and we would get you know attendance awards at the end of the year. And that's as a as a kid that grew up with chronic illness, and this is kind of aside from my other point. That's tough, you know. Like um, I did okay in school, right? But it was it was still difficult, especially when you're looking at an attendance policy where you know our expectations that you're here every day. And I sometimes would take that personally, but as an adult, I don't anymore. But I do think about the students that whether it's a chronic mental illness or a chronic physical illness that keeps them out of the doors. We want to make sure that we have a policy to reflect that they are still a valued member of our school community. And that, I think, is ultimately the point of the kind of change that I'd like to make to this policy, that we are, we are doing our best to include and be equitable to every student in the way that we, we present our policies to them. And I, I know that this, you know, this might not be the goal of everybody at the table, but that would be my goal if I could, if I could have it 100% my way and be yeah. super selfish about it. <laughs> I'm not in disagreement with all of what you're saying about yeah. kids and mental health needs. My worry is how is this going to play out in practice for our school yeah. nurses and our building principals? Like I think if if this is the change we want to make, we should consult with the building principals because. Yeah. When we put this into practice, it really changes things. Like when I go back to the two bereavement days and seven days out that I was afforded that I didn't have to tell you why I was out. It's, it's really challenging when you have a student who will then say, well, I didn't come because the weather was lousy or I didn't come because, and now you've got a student who is 
And, and I don't want to say that all of our kids would ever play a game, but like there are some kids who will continue to find reasons not to come to school within the confines of this, and you'll have a kid who's graduating, and they there was a 180-day school year, and that person managed to be out of school 35 days. Right. Right. Like that's that's not. So do you think by to clarify, I think what you're saying is you you're afraid of putting mental health language into this will allow students to kind of circumvent the innate the like nature of the policy or the spirit of the no policy? because if you put the kind of mental health thing that you're talking about I think it's covered by the seven days right. that's what I'm saying yeah so, I just want the language in there right I'm happy to do that but yeah. the worry that I have about it is once we say mental health language in there now do we also have to in some way incorporate physical health language and when you get to the slippery slope of physical health language because that's not mentioned here either right. now we have to have the school nurse say ooh let's see it's a cold. Do you feel like it might be the flu? Because the flu is covered, but the cold is not. Like, right. Well, I don't think we need to do that because when we say, um, when in the further down part of it, we say chronic or long-term illness or quarantine. We don't specify. You can have, um, you know, whatever chronic long-term illness. I use myself. Kidney transplant is equally as covered as um, sure. an autoimmune disorder. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't call that out. If we say mental health, chronic or long-term mental health illness, we don't have to specifically say depression, anxiety, a, an acute, an acute um, stressor that is impacting their school right. day. But we wouldn't put the mental health in the excused part. Right. But, right. We're, right. but we be don't unexcused. have to define it because mental health is like physical health as an umbrella term, right? I, is that what you're concerned about, that we are saying, and I'm giving an umbrella term and you don't want to have to get into the nitty gritty of it? Yeah, I'm looking at the opening paragraph where we say that a public school district may excuse up to seven day sessions or 14 half day sessions in any period of six months. Sure. And so those first sort of seven phone calls that come in from a parent saying, my child's not coming to school today, she's got the sniffles, my child's not coming to school today, um, she just doesn't feel, feel up to it. Like we excuse those first seven right. because the law says we have to. Yeah. But then after that, you get to these are the things that yes we excuse because sort of again those those are things that that really plague a kid's life right like bereavement does yeah. or a chronic illness does that, or we wouldn't want parents to feel like their kids were were unsafe so if we have a, a list of things that we are excusing for and in that long-term illness, there certainly could be either physical illness or mental illness. We don't clarify. Right. By clarifying on the front page, mental illness, now we have eliminated all of the other physical illnesses. But we, I don't know that if, if we're not, um, since we don't have any reason and given in the front paragraph, it doesn't, and I don't, I don't envision this necessarily being in that first paragraph. I want. I would even like a value statement saying that we like value our children's mental and physical health as well as personal safety, right? We want, I just want me mental health called out as a opportunity to signal to our, all of our students, all of our family that we value both physical and mental health. And I understand exactly what you're saying because mm -hmm. then it becomes like a, a fact finding mission for our nurses who are already probably already way overburdened, but, right? Well, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to a stereotype, but kids already fake stomach aches, right? So yeah, they don't they have do. to go into yeah. school. We have, like, yeah. they, <laughs> but it, it, it happens. I, I don't think we need to define it to the nth degree. We, first of all, clarify that those seven days are separate from the excused absences, that mm -hmm. they are anything go anything yeah. you you want for those seven days right and then you can say as, <laughs> well sort of Let's, but you can yeah. say as an example I mean, a parent can't call and say i'm just keeping my yeah, kid yeah, home yeah. because i feel like it right yeah yeah. yeah yeah but but as nancy said you could just put for example you know an acute mental thing or an acute physical thing and you don't have to like define what each acute mental or physical thing is but just these are really short-term things right those can count under the seven days and I'm not saying that's the wording either right. I mean the, hopefully you have some time to think about it before we go back 
Um, the one sentence, the, the our objective is that every student attends school every day on time for the full day. I had not latched onto that until right, they brought it up, and now I'm latched onto it. Um, when my child, so I'm going to bring in a story, and then I'm going to try to tie it in. When my child um, had his IEP at one point, when he was younger, there was a line in there that said, he will perform non-preferred tasks. 80% of the time. And I was like, but that's not really what I want. What I want is for my child to appropriately state that he is does not prefer that task to the teacher, you know, like in a way that allows them to, um, I don't know, negotiate, get some information back, maybe figure out an, a different way of doing things. So doing the non-preferred task 80% of the time doesn't help the kid. It's more like a structural thing that the school gives you. And, and so to me, like when I read that sentence of going to school every day, and that's our goal, it's like, well, I mean, is that really my goal? My goal is that my kid get educated, that they be healthy, that they be happy. And hopefully that means they go to school every day because school is keeping them healthy and happy. But, but my goal isn't that my kid go to school every day. Like, the, the going to school is where those things are happening, yeah. I hope. And so, therefore, they will be going to school every day. But going to school every day is definitely not the goal, right? Yeah. The goal is the education, whatever else. And so, if my kid is um, not doing well for some reason, then my goal wouldn't be that they go to school. Right, because I, I would want them somewhere where they feel healthier, or happier, or whatever. So, like that sentence, I think that's why it bothers me because it's like it's not really, it's not quite the right twist on on the thought. It's the attendance objective, like it's the like it's the intention of the atten attendance policy, but it's maybe not your whole objective for your right. student. Like the, right. then you're looking at and and so it maybe it's just the tweak to the wording yeah. to make it more about the attendance policy or something yeah. instead of... Okay. Maybe it will be helpful if I read some of the law. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it does in here say that every child between the minimum and maximum ages established for school attendance by the Board of Education um, will attend school during the number of days required by the Board of Education in each school year. So it, it does say that, but it also says uh, such attendance shall not be required of a child whose physical or mental condition is such as to render attendance inexpedient or impracticable. Oh, so, so that's both really nice those language. things are in there. That's a nice language. You know, so maybe it just to makes sense to it into the the do that. what the law already does for us. <laughs> I think that's excellent. That, that, that is good. Deep. Right. That's good. Only other question I have, and this is for, for to come back the next okay. time, yes. um, would be a legal question, which is where it says a public school district may excuse up to seven day sessions, et cetera. Is, does the word excuse have to be there? Because I think that might take some of the confusion. If we could put like allow mm -hmm. instead of, in, and that I, might be a legal issue, but. I don't know if it's legal so much as it is in practice. Like we say, excused and unexcused. And then once you eat up the number of excused days that you have, you can start to get to loss of credit. We would say that, I'm sorry, you're at seven, yep. a bellyache is unexcused, bereavement is excused. Yep. I, I'll, I'll tell you, just to say, a former high school administrator, when, when kids get to that place of loss of credit, you know, parents will do things like call the dentist and say to the dentist, can you please say my child had an oral surgery this morning? Like, and, <laughs> It, it becomes a okay. crazy yes. thing. Yes. I know it sounds, but because of the, the sort of the practical nature yep. of what happens in our schools, I don't want to make a change that will end up being okay. terrible for our administrators or nurses. Okay. I liked the legal language that yeah. you just I, I, like I feel legal like legal it was too. inclusive and, mm -hmm. yep. and it Souls. wasn't like old yeah. timey like legal speech. So it's very clear and it's very it is. Is. I like straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Thank you. in the interest of time, I, I want to push <laughs> this that. back to the policy <laughs> right. and the, a couple of yep. things that um, I would like would be, one would be if our administrators and nurses could take a look at the policy sure. before yes. we vote, and vote on it. the building principles. The, the, right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and the, the okay. legal stuff. Good. 
Thank you. That's good. Okay. Thank so you. Thank you all yeah, for indulging that thing you knew I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that brings us into our next policy, um, which is policy JBB, which is the um, educational equity policy. You went back to basics. I'm so happy. <laughs> this policy went back to how it was, and then it got cleaned up, and it, it looks gorgeous. This is, yeah, this is, I'm very happy with, with what came back. Um, I think it very much touches on exactly what I wanted to say, which is the st statistical disproportionality piece. Like, that's my huge thing. It's in here. Um, yeah. The overrepresentation piece. An underrepresentation piece, which was my big concern, and using the district wide and individual school level data disaggregated. So it's all in here. I'm very happy with where you went. <laughs> I think the policy is wonderful. Yeah. This is, yeah. this is I wasn't here for that. I've been like. <laughs> I wasn't here <laughs> when it was originally proposed and written, so it, you can kind of feel the spirit of what you guys were going for, and I appreciate it. It is the sixth reading of this okay. policy. Yeah. Which I, think might be a I saw that and I was like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so any other feedback that came from the community on this or that the policy working group would like to share? So I did have a parent email me about um, the, the inclusion of gifted programs in it, and I saw that now it's struck, it's struck out. It's just like, Which we programs? have a secret gifted program uh -huh. that um, we have, and that's good. No, it's, it's number five. It says um, under uh, oh yes, yeah, and, yep, gifted, gifted enrichment. enrichment programs. Yeah. Yep. So I I said that that is probably something that we will discuss at the next meeting, and I see it eliminated. So I'm assuming that answers her question. Yes, we don't have hidden gifted programs. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <I'm> That's <laughs> how rumors get started. <laughs> um, My only question. Into perpetuity, do you want this to say that the superintendent shall include equity practices in the district strategic plan as a preventative measure in support of this policy? I have no problem with the second sentence that says that the superintendent will make reports to the committee on the progress of the implementation of the policy, but I feel like this policy is something that you have to do all the time. You have to watch over yeah. and under yeah, yeah, representation. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So to say that you're going to put it in the strategic plan, I think but it's crossed out. Isn't it's it? too much. Isn't the green yeah, is crossed out? Is it crossed out or highlighted? Yeah. No, it's, it's hard highlighted. To tell. Okay. I think because it was something that <laughs> oh, no, when okay we talked about it, it last night. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with it being gone. I, I assumed I, it was gone. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can take a vote. I was going to say, does somebody think they would like to make a motion? There's a party going on on the side of the table. I would. When you see all the groups that Yeah, it's pretty fun. It's a long list. Yeah. Do we have to approve it as amended, though, whoever makes that mention? Yes. So I vote to approve policy JBB as amended. Do I have to say anything else? No, I think you're good. So motion by Leah. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Second by Amanda. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that um, passes and does not need to come back for a seventh reading. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, fabulous. Um, and I know, Leah, you had worked on it last year quite a bit, too. So all three of you, nice job. All right. So that um, brings us into future agenda items. We do still have a few outstanding that we have not gotten to yet. Um, but are in our horizon, the bullying and a couple of other things. Yeah, yeah we already hit the transportation one, so thank you for that. Um, Office hours, were you going to do yes, so it's well, scheduling? Let's do the scheduling. I, I thought it might be nice to try to do something before we come back here in two weeks. But we can look at if that's aggressive in terms of timeline, um, in case anybody had wanted to just talk capital. But <laughs> <laughs> so future is not necessarily next meeting. It's it, correct. It's okay. things exactly. It's things so in. Since we have goals, yes, I would like to have like a mid term or whatever yes. yeah. review of how we're progressing towards. The yes, goals. Yeah. I like that. I, I like that as well. And since it's almost was, November, when is midterm? Right. <laughs> I was when, thinking when that it, like as the, the semesters in the high school and you get into like February and we're looking at the okay. yeah. superintendents 
goals. Yeah, kind because of, by be then we should have something with the ESBC too. Right. We should have some office hours right. scheduled, it's, so we should see progress. Still a little bit of time left to improve if we feel like we're not hitting our goals to kind of yeah. to look enough time to make some progress, but enough time to also correct course if we need to. Okay. I'd love to ask, I don't know if this is part of future agenda items, but I'd love to ask the policy working group if you, you have any policies that you're working on right now that um, are, would be of interest to the community. I know that you were working on. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like they all are. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that you mean, there's a, right. like a difference between right. this policy and like, I don't know, like a lunchroom tray policy. Right, right, right. You know. folks are right. Something that would be more impactful or yeah. a, hot, a hot button kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so people are prepared for it mentally. In, in terms of future agenda items and kind of ter turning that into maybe we could discuss how the working policy group reports out like what your if you have a calendar or you can yeah. have some time to think about how you want to maybe bring yeah. that back yeah. yeah next time i like that okay then that brings us into items by consensus okay as superintendent i recommend the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda so moved Motion second by leah second by jen all those in favor yeah aye, aye. and that um passes and then we actually caught up there a little bit. We're, we're ahead of schedule, so we would, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So okay. moved. Okay. Um, motion sorry. by Holly. Second. Second by Holly. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we are adjourned at 9, uh, 9 16. And our next meeting is November 10th. It's a regular meeting here um, at HCAM. And then I hope people will tune in next week for the ESBC um, forum on Wednesday. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four.